to session four of our Responsible Raw Materials Annual Conference. Um, we are absolutely honoured and delighted, actually, with regards to the response that we've been having to this conference, the exciting discussion and insight that has been given to us by all of our fabulous speakers. If you haven't dialed into this conference until now, don't worry, you'll be able to catch up on all of the talks, all of the discussion that we've been having um, on the YouTube channel and also through the website. The website, which is just www.responsiblerawmaterials.com, contains all of the abstracts for the talks that you're about to hear. And it also contains all of the edited videos, almost, for all of the talks that we've heard over the last few days. You will also see that we've been writing blogs or summaries as to what, what we've been hearing. Um, and also we've been posting links to all of the tools that people have shared with us during the course of this week so far. So if you want to go back and find something where possible, we have been sharing and collating those links together, which is really exciting. Now, um, in terms of all of this, um, two more announcements, I think, before I pass across to the wonderful author. The first thing is that if you are enjoying this conference um, and you want to know more, or perhaps you are interested in a bit more training, we are really, really glad to be able to tell you that we've received enough sponsorship to pay for a number of training courses which are being run next week and the week after. Um, because we've received some lovely sponsorship, those training courses are being run for free. So if you would like a free seat on what is normally um, a nice costly training course, um, looking at what does responsible mining actually mean, but also things like um, integrated risk management in mining. If you're interested in coming along on a training course, please either email hello at responsiblerawmaterials.com and you will get Rose um, or email Ellen at um, Ellen at Satala com and they will be able to slot you in on one of those free training courses so if you're interested to know more there's information on the website or if you just want to bagsy that seat that's an old word I have not used that word in a long time basically if you want to take your seat okay or book your seat please feel free to email either Rose or Ellen and they will be putting their email addresses into the chat in a second just in case you want to know about that more also, um, we are running a bit of a competition um, and that competition um, is um, there will be prizes, we promise, and we will announce the winners at the end of the week. Last year, we invited everybody to send in drawings or pictures of what they thought a mine looked like. Um, we will be sharing some of these pictures with you as we go through the week because they were absolutely fantastic and gave us a really good insight as to the different perspectives that people have of mining. Um, so this year, we're going to ask you, or we are asking you, what does a responsible mine look like? Now that might be exactly the same picture, or it might be something that is rather different. So if you would like to enter our competition as to what does a responsible mine look like, um, again, we celebrate all levels of drawing ability. So don't feel embarrassed if you feel that your drawing <laughs> skills aren't up to it. Also, we have had people go electronic and give us all manner of different submissions. So please feel free to send through your drawings to hello at res uh, responsiblerawmaterials.com. Um, so Rose will put that email address into the chat again. So if you've got a drawing that you would like to submit, and this can come from you, it can come from a family member, I think there will be bonus marks if it's drawn by your seven-year-old niece or something like that, because you'd like to get their insight as to what they think a responsible mine might look like as well. Please do feel free to send them through and we will be using them as part of our discussion later on this week. So without further ado, I would like to um, introduce you to the wonderful author. I'm going to allow her to actually introduce herself properly. I'm going to chicken out of this one. Orsa is going to be your main master of ceremonies as we go through the next few hours. Um, we are in very, very capable hands. So it is a true honor and joy to be able to pass everything across to Orsa to get proceedings underway. Orsa, over to you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah, and congrats to you and Rose on a fantastic conference so far. Um, and it's my pleasure to be joining you this morning. We have another exciting day ahead of us, jam-packed with interesting talks, and I'm personally looking forward to hearing 
all the presentations. Um, but let me just say a few more words about me and what I do. Um, I am the host of High Grade Media. Uh, High Grade is a non-for-profit organization established to produce and disseminate ideas, knowledge and best practice in the natural resources sector. We publish video interviews and podcasts with experts and thought leaders online open access and free for anyone to use and abuse. Um, and we like to think that high grade stands at the forefront on the debate on natural resources and development. You can visit us on our website, highgrade.media. But I won't be talking that much more about me because it's all about the presentations today. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first guest of today, Geraldine, all the way joining us all the way from Australia. Um, Geraldine, if you can sort of get yourself ready, unmute and have your presentation ready, Rose. Um, and the, the topic uh, is ESG and the life of mine. Geraldine, over to you. You have a time, 10 minute time slot. Thank you. Uh, uh, just hello to everybody from Australia. It's actually happy hour here. So that means you can start drinking. So even if in the UK, I'll give you permission to do that. Um, so I, I'm talking about ESG and the life of mine. This is a, a topic really that I'm very passionate about because I think it's through how we close our minds that we're judged as an industry. And unfortunately, we haven't done a very good job of that globally. So there, I'm, I'm going to look at what frameworks are available um, to guide us in mind closure. And then in the absence of some of those frameworks, what are some of the tools or techniques that we can use to do good mind closures? So. We're saying, yes, it's, it's 2021 and the, and the world's talking about ESG. It's all about performance, accountability and transparency. Next one. So what, why are people and why has this topic come up? And it's really about societal shifts um, in the attitudes to environment and climate, regulators reacting to community concerns, economic drivers, as well as things like happened in Australia last year, which were our super funds, uh, violently reacted to what happened with the Junkum Gorge destruction in Western Australia. Next one. So from an evolutionary perspective of ESG, we really started talking about these topics but talked about them in terms of environmental reporting back in the 1990s. We then moved to talk about CSR or corporate social responsibility, but now the topic's all around ESG. And, and that was starting to develop prior to COVID, but it's been accelerated by these by the pandemic and also by the Junkin Gorge disaster. And quite recently in Australia, we've actually adopted the Towards Sustainable Mining, which is a Canadian framework, um, and that's been adopted by the Minerals Council of Australia. So next, so as I said, there's, there's increasing demands, but the main point I want to make here is that, that we have all these multiple ESG reporting frameworks. Uh, people tell me all the time that they're challenging, confusing, really hard to follow. So, so which one should we be using and which are the most helpful? So here's a big list um, of some of those frameworks. Um, personally, I found that, that the Global Reporting Initiative, the GRI, is probably the most useful in terms of sustainability reporting and is most widely used by the mining industry. And then, as I said, towards sustainable mining, which is the Canadian framework, has been adopted by, by Australia. We go. But within all of these, what is where's the guidance on mine closure? There's quite a lot of guidance around starting and operating a mine. Um, and for example, with the towards sustainable mining initiative, um, the really big change for us in Australia is to, to make sure that these on-site assessments are actually done. It's not just done at a corporate level, it's actually each site that they're transparent and they're overseen by an advisory board. So, but what about the guidance on closure? Next slide. So the only real discussion is that, as is in the guiding principles, is to minimise the impact from expiration through to closure. So that, that's as, as much as the guidance gives you. And then if we go to the next slide and we look at the, the International Council of Mining and Metallurgy, Principle 2, once again, under the performance expectation, it talks about how decision-making processes need to include design, operation and closure of facilities. And, and that's about all the guidance that we're given. So move, moving on to a couple of case studies. So this is a, a project that I worked on 
uh, back in the 90s, um, so quite some time ago where there was really very little guidance at all around ESG and, and certainly we're in a very remote site and, and I don't think anybody knew we are even there most of the time. So, so how did we move forward with a really good case study and a really good um, outcome? I think the key to it was really having great stakeholder engagement, including um, really knowing who our stakeholders were and sitting down with those people and working through what, what were the ESG issues um, and making sure that, that we listened carefully and, and actually over quite a long period of time to make sure that we ended up with the, the ultimate um, closure designs and also outcomes that would be sustainable for that site in that particular context and location. So what were the outcomes? Uh, the final land use was actually a protected forest. We had to change the legislation because prior to mining it was actually a concession logging area. So we changed it to being a protected forest incorporated all, all sorts of um, fruit trees, native fruit trees into the rehabilitation and then made sure that the site was, was safe and uh, safe, stable and self-sustaining. And it was really because of that that we were then able to enter into this partnership with the World Wildlife Fund, who now use it as a wildlife sanctuary for the very rare Borneo rhinoceros. And part of the whole governance, so the G side of things, is that we um, set up a trust fund, which is located in Singapore, and the interest from that trust fund actually goes to employing local rangers who come from the local villages to maintain that the site and the ongoing monitoring and maintenance requirements. So that, that was a really positive outcome. That was, it's been closed for 10 years and it's still being sustained at, for that land use um, with those qualities in place. The, ne the next case study I wanted to mention was um, back here in Western Australia. Um, so the Argyle Diamond Mine is a sacred women's site, um, very important for the people within that community. Um, and a lot of people were employed at that mine. Um, however, in Australia, our legislation here is very unimaginative in terms of um, what the site can be used for post-closure. And it's really based around cattle grazing or returning it to native vegetation. So once again, there was really good stakeholder engagement here with the traditional owners or the Aboriginal communities and looking at all sorts of different options about incorporating native species into the rehabilitation that could be, could be used for food or botanical purposes or even for other rehabilitation programs on, on other sites. There's also the option of thinking around how to incorporate renewable energies, some more novel concepts that are being explored now around carbon sequestration and, and carbon credit programs. Um, tourism is a really big opportunity in this area. It's just such a really magnificent part of the world. And also, once again, looking at um, incorporating local ranger programs into to post closure opportunities. So once again, some really creative options here. Um, so even in the absence of frameworks, there's, there's good models that you can draw on. And then finally, got a couple of drawings. I didn't know that we were having this competition about what a good mine looks like. So but on the left, it's a, it's a pretty messy mine, um, lots of earthworks going on and a very little engagement with the local community. And then on the right is, is kind of my ideal um, mine closure where we've involved the local community, we've got renewable energies, we've got um, you know, the place rehabilitated and we've got some lovely post-mining land uses that, that everybody can use. And then my last slide is, well, how do you make this happen? Um, and to me, it's actually all about integration. And, and my experience in the industry over the last 30 years has been you really start off as this sort of championed approach, you know, as it's you feel like you're the only person there, you know, bossing everybody around and trying to make things happen. But, but as, as these frameworks develop and these tools develop, what we seem to be able to do is take guidance from safety, where we do have all these key performance indicators and build environment and, and social and governance into these, um, these frameworks and to these KPIs so that, so that we have everybody on board, everyone working in the same direction. And, uh, and it just makes for a much more harmonious um, experience and, and much less stressful for the person who's, who's in charge of having to do this. And so that's it for me, a quick run through, um, give you some ideas and happy to answer questions and um, not sure if I'll be here for the end of the panel, but happy to answer questions by chat as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was amazing.
Mm, so I, I, di I did an interview with someone called Elias Masilela. He's an impact investors, uh, impact investment expert. And he was talking about how mine closure is the litmus test for, for the mining industry, whether they're an impactful investor or not. So I think he would agree with what you were saying about the importance of mine closure. Now, my question is, why do you feel, why do you think that mine closure has been such an overlooked topic in the industry for, for such a long time? Well, I think people like when things start, it's very exciting and it, it brings the, the best and the brightest so attracted to those opportunities. And uh, whereas what I found being on site at closure, you know, when your room starts to fall down around your ears and, uh, you know, and most people leave to go on to other jobs, that it can actually be quite stressful and a bit depressing, probably a bit like ageing. And uh, so so my pleasure is, has had this kind of, you know, I guess attitude that it's, it's the end of something, um, rather than I actually like to use the term repurposing. So, like, what's the new, new life that we could be instilling here? And, uh, we, you know, around where I live, We've got some really great renewable energy projects that are being kicked off on on our mine site. So instead of looking at it at the end, I think if the industry looked at it as the beginning, it, it would actually change the attitude and also uh, um, attract a different demographic of, of of people, young people, seeing this as as a career opportunity rather than a, kind of a punishment to be left around at the end of the mine life. So I, I think that's part of it. Um, part of it, I think, is the lack of legislation, um, which is starting to improve as well. Um, so, so a few different things there. I think, you know, we need to make mine closure a bit more sexy and probably we get more young people and, and young professionals involved. And I think it's interesting also who should take the lead on this, because it is ultimately the community that is left after mine closure. So do you feel that they should take the lead in a, maybe a more pronounced way than just being part of a consultation? Definitely. And look, what, what I find is there's still a lot of pushback from the industry in, in enabling that to happen. Um, I think part of the reason why we were so successful in Indonesia is we actually used a traditional decision making process, which was about consensus decision making. So everybody was very empowered and everybody had power of veto um, if they didn't like what was being proposed. Um, but I mean, everybody signed off on what was proposed in the end. Um, so, so that meant the community really felt empowered to step forward and to be able to make those decisions. Um, whereas, you know, I still find a lot of um, people involved in mining say, oh, we don't want to start those consultations on mine closure because it just means, you know, the community will get really demanding and they'll, you know, the costs will go up and it's like, well, actually, these are the people going to be left behind at the, when the mine is finished. So, we need to involve them as soon as possible in those conversations and uh, so that they can actually build the capacity to, to take over and run the site um, when, when the mine has moved away. And that's exactly what our experience was in Indonesia and, and also in Western Australia is, is that, you know, local communities want to step up, they want to be the rangers, they, they want to look at other business opportunities that are available. Mm. And there, this is really a topic that is uh, getting a lot of attention in our social media channels here. We have one question from Stuart. Um, if you were developing or financing these mines now, which frameworks would you adopt? Uh, look, I think the, the Towards Sustainable Mining is a really good framework to, to start from. Um, and I'm actually doing some ESG reviews at the moment for some mergers and acquisitions. And um, we're using a range of different frameworks. So the ICMM principles are a really good way to be looking at whether um, what's been um, proposed is being done in a, in a correct way. Um, I'm also finding that, that individual um, commodities are starting to develop their own framework. So there's an um, aluminium stewardship initiative which is also really helpful and very thorough. Um, and then the equator principles really sit over the top of that um, in terms of the guiding investor input into, um, you know, whether these frameworks have been put in place and whether, um, you know, things like Indigenous people's participation has actually been covered thoroughly. So, so there's, there's a few different tools and I think sometimes you have to have a few different tools in the toolkit. Um, you know, we have a saying that if you've only got 
you know, a hammer in the toolkit, everything starts looking like a nail. So it's actually good to have a range of different tools in the toolkit that you can bring out in different scenarios and different contexts. That's fantastic, Geraldine. Thank you so much for joining us again. And a round of applause, a virtual round of applause <laughs> for Geraldine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. OK, so we're moving on to the next exciting topic. Grant, if you can prepare everything, unmute, uh, prepare your PowerPoint. Um, and I will uh, also let you introduce yourself. You're also with us from Australia and the title of your talk is scientifically verifying the origin of raw materials is critical to the delivery of ESG. So I am going to hand over to you. Fantastic. Um, can everyone see my presentation? Is that up on the screen? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, firstly, obviously, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, obviously, it's it's such an important topic. Um, and, uh, you know, if we truly deliver ESG, um, what we'll find is that so many more people on this planet will share in some of the relative, um, you know, success and freedom um, that um, the Western world's had for a long time. So really important topic. Um, and a key part of what I'm going to talk about is um, a component within the toolkit, but is not necessarily something you consider ESG, um, and that is, um, you know, the scientific provenance verification of raw materials and how that fits into a broader ESG framework and to in ensure that it is delivered. So, um, you know, we, we very much see um, that the scientific process to verify where products come from will help support um, the delivery of the United Nations broader sustainable development goals. Um, you know, within that, I, I want to probably just start and, and say that um, if ESG isn't designed to primarily focus on supporting um, the world's most vulnerable communities, then who are they supporting? And I think that's a really important question um, to ask because when things don't go um, well, um, ultimately you start seeing more pictures that we've got on the screen. So, so you know, is ESG more around the virtue signaling of large corporate corporations saying they're doing something, or is it really around protecting the most vulnerable of communities who are often, by the nature of where some of our mine sites are situated, they tend to be isolated in, in, in regional areas, and just by the very nature of that um, that 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 distance, uh, you know, doesn't get the visibility. Um, that that most of us would like. So, so that's what we really focus on um, from our perspective, and we always keep that front of mind. Um, when we get into the details of, of, of why verifying provenance for raw materials is integral to ESG, it might be good just to actually just to walk through a very simple process flow of, of how an ESG program gets, gets rolled out. So, so we start down the bottom of the screen um, at one, which is an ESG standard. Um, source certain as an organization um, doesn't get involved in what that ESG standard um, should should ultimately deliver. Um, you know, those rules um, and expectations we think will evolve over time. Um, for example, the expectation of, of indigenous employment within, within a mine site in Australia might be very different to one in Canada. Um, you know, the emphasis that we put on um, levels of diversity um, at corporate management may be very different in 10 years to what we have now. Um, and so what we do know is um, the expectations of what the ESG standards will be will change over time. So our role at Source Certain isn't to influence that because that's ultimately something to be influenced by the consumers, the businesses and the industries. Um, but ultimately, there will be an ESG standard um, across various certification bodies. And our job is to help make sure that ESG standard gets delivered. So you start with a standard, you're then auditing a mine site against that standard. So that's that's the second part of the process flow that we get to now. Um, and then thirdly, we ultimately get a product um, or a series of products, whether they're raw materials or um, products that have been processed from those raw materials that are carrying an ESG claim to the consumer. And so that's your standard ESG model. There's a standard, you're auditing the standard to the mine site, and then there's products that enter the market um, with those ESG claims. If we don't verify um, the provenance of the raw materials or the process materials, how do we really know that we're delivering on, on those ESG commitments? So verifying where those products have come from, 
allows us to link those products with the ESG claim directly back to the mine sites that have been audited against that ESG standard. If you do that independently and you do that to a scientific basis, then you can build trust and transparency into the supply chain and you can build trust and integrity into the ESG standard. So the real critical element there is, are we independently testing the product for the claims that are being made? And the claim being made here that this product has come from a specific mine site that is audited to a specific ESG standard. And then if we can do that, Ultimately, we're going to ensure that those ESG standards that have been rigorously upheld by the third party audit process are actually being delivered in the products that we're actually consuming. And so independent and scientific um, um, are, are key elements within that process. So that's why we believe that, that you know, that the, the, the verifying the origin of the provenance for raw materials is absolutely critical in delivering um, ESG commitments. So if we go down one, um, what happens if we don't? And so... Uh, we go through the exact same process flow. We've got a great ESG standard. We're auditing the mine sites of that standard. Products are then produced that have been sold into the market with ESG claims. But if we don't independently verify the origin claims of those materials, how do we know where it came from? Um, there's no large corporation that's going to make a claim today that, say, that says their products aren't ethical and unsustainable. So... Um, and they're all going to sort of reference their work into some form of standard because if they don't, they won't have a social license to operate. So everyone is making some form of claim that they're making, um, you know, delivery of ex consumer expectations around those ESG standards. But without independently verifying where those products come from, there's a question. Where did it come from? You know, did it come from a mine site um, that have slaves in it? The fact is, if you don't verify the the origins well then how do you know and, and 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 that's and that's a real point of contention with some existing global standards that were very good at auditing um to an ESG standard but weren't very good at verifying that the products that come through and carry their certification to the market have actually come from those claim sources as a result um what we've seen probably over the last 10 years and probably more acutely over the last few years is some real pressure on some of the existing industry bodies and some of the existing global standards. And so here's just a bit of a snapshot around, um, you know, some very prominent and public um, criticisms of the LBMA um, from the various, um, you know, NGOs and, and, and other organisations that have been pushing more ethical, sustainable sourcing within that sector. Um, and ultimately they've been very criti critical um, because, you know, the more that you dive into the details, um, the more that it allows certain gold refiners just to say, hey, we've done it. We've done a bit of work, but we're not going to tell you where our gold comes from. So um, now, if you don't know where your gold comes from, quite simply, how do you know that it's sustainable and ethical? You, 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 can't, you can't marry those two things. Either you know where you got your, the sources of the gold come from, and then you audit those sites to a specific standard. But if you don't know, yeah, sure, you can make the claim that you're ethically and sustainably sourcing your gold, but in reality, it's nothing but virtue signaling. Um, and as a result, um, there's immense pressure um, on the gold industry at the moment. Um, then we can dovetail into the similar pressures that are on the natural grown diamond industry. Um, you know, we all know the Blood Diamond movie that really brought that issue to, um, you know, to the forefront of consumer awareness. Um, at the same time, the Kimberley protocols, Kimberley process was being worked on. Um, and the real questions we need to ask, did that deliver transparency within the, within the diamond supply chains? Now, you know, you can buy a $50 shirt or a $50 dress um, from your local shop and it will tell you it came from England or India or the US, but you can buy a $20,000 diamond that's going to be with your family for the rest of your life that's going to signify the love you have for your partner but for some reason they can't tell you where that diamond came from. So, so it hasn't delivered the transparency um, within the natural grown diamond supply chain. As a result, you've seen once again, some very prominent um, NGOs be heavily critical of the Kimberley process. Um, you've seen large retailers like Pandora recently make the announcement that they're no longer going to be utilizing and using natural grown diamonds in their product suite and will be exclusively using lab-grown diamonds. So consumers are making a difference. Um, some businesses are reacting, 
Um, there are many businesses that are trying to do the right thing, but are just struggling to get the information on um, the ultimate sources of their product. Um, and also means the broad industry is under pressure. And we're seeing, um, you know, the, natu- the lab grown diamond producers take advantage of that and know that their freedom to operate is providing transparency and information around how, how they produce the diamonds that ultimately go into the market. So this is some of the broad macro trends um, and, and the issues that, that sit within um, ESG programs that don't have scientific verification that links the product back to where those ESG claims are being made. Um, what I might, wouldn't, wouldn't mind doing is just dovetailing a little bit into what Source Certain does and then into um, how we have an intricate insight into some of these issues because of the work that we do. Um, ultimately, we're a business that pioneered um, scientific provenance verification. So scientific methods that can independently verify where products come from. Um, where it originally began uh, was in a term that we call, what well, we termed gold fingerprinting. Um, and ultimately, in really simplistic terms, um, you know, when, when, when a mineralization event occurs, um, the, the mineral or object that ultimately is going to be coming out of the ground also absorbs other elements from its environment. Um, and we're testing those elements, um, sometimes the parts per billion and sometimes the parts per trillion. And it's those trace elements that a product absorbs from its environment Uh, which is a unique signature of not only the product, but where the product has originated from. So it's a scientific method. Um, It's been accepted um, into um, the court of law. Um, It's extensively peer reviewed. Um, So it's it's a well-established scientific method um, that's been been used. Um, In terms of a practical application, um, our business has been working and supporting um, um, law enforcement agencies around the world for, for 30 years. Um, we've done a lot of work in stolen and smuggled diamonds. We've done a lot of work in, in stolen and, and smuggled and conflict gold. Um, what you're seeing here is um, just a little bit around what we do in diamonds, for example, where you know a diamond is pretty much 99% carbon um, and then 1% something else and then 0.00 something of all the other elements that can give you a characteristic of where the product is from. So we're analysing those other elements, the parts per billion that identifies where the diamond comes from. Um, You know, we worked on a very famous case where we were able to trace um, diamonds back to the Argyle um, diamond uh, mine in in WA, which is on on our doorstep. And we've done lots of other cases where we've been given a consignment of diamonds and need to work out um, where they they came from. So, um, you know, this is an anonymized um, uh, investigation that we did. Um, What you're seeing on the right is a graphical representation of the fingerprints that we've created from the diamonds that we've received. Um, the claim that came with this consignment of diamonds that they come from a singular source. So it came from one country or well, one mine in one country. Um, and we're asked to try and untangle that. Um, and when we untangled where those diamonds were from, clearly a lot of these diamonds had different chemical signatures. Um, and when we go one step further, um, if you look to the right, what you actually start seeing is that we can actually piece together that um, not only do these diamonds not come from one source, but we're seeing about eight separate sources. The separation in some of those sources suggests to us that those diamonds had actually come from two separate countries. And so in one country, um, there looks like there's six separate mines where these diamonds are coming from. And then in the other, in the other country, it looks like there's, there's, there's two separate mines. So the, the question that needs to be answered is, is if, if these diamonds come with a claim from one singular source and those sources are wrapped up in a Kimberley process, um, what, what, what were those other seven sources? Where are they? Who owns them? How well are the people that live around that mine site treated? Are those mine sites polluting you know, the natural rivers that the Indigenous pop- population live? All those questions remain unanswered because none of those mine sites have been audited to an ESG standards because we don't, we don't even know that they exist. What we do know is the claims that are being made on that singular consignment of diamonds is scientifically false. Um, and hence the pressure un, under the Kimberley process and why a lot of people really don't pay much attention to it. And hence we're looking for alternative solutions now that will either be driven by the market or be driven by um, the regulators or be driven by the industry. Um, so on that point, what does Source Certain do? This is a bit of a graphical representation of how we embed our technology within a supply chain system that ultimately continues to verify 
the origin claims of not just the raw material that you're seeing on the far left of the screen, but as that product is transformed, this is for rare earth. So this is as the product comes out of the ground that has a unique fingerprint. And then every time that product is transformed either via on-site processing or via the refinery um, or via other downstream um, processors and manufacturers, they all have a, a, a unique fingerprint um, in the way that they've transformed the product. We capture all that information, we're collecting physical samples and we're, and we're analyzing those phys physical samples to determine the provenance and then we're continually testing and validating that the products that are coming through that supply chain are coming from those ESG audited sites. So on the, on the parallel, you can see that um, our, our scientific methods are also embedded within a blockchain traceability system, which is capturing all the information to relay the information that consumers and downstream buyers are needing. That could be anything from what was the, what was the, you know, what was the amount of carbon that was used um, within that process. Um, and so the blockchain traceability system captures that information to communicate it. Um, there's obviously some system that can label the product so the, the products have a unique identifier um, through, through the process. And then there's certifications that are attached to whatever ESG standard is being audited against. Um, and then we wrap our technology within that um, to make sure you've got the traceability um, that captures information of what's going on. Um, you've got the chain of custody, who owns the product and at what point did it transform? Um, and then you've got the scientific testing that validates the products have actually come through that supply chain. So that's a bit of an example of how we piece things together um, from a broader supply chain integrity process. Um, in, terms of, in terms of actual programs now that we're working through, because of the issue in diamonds, um, the group um, SCS Global have now um, designed a new um, ESG program to support ethical and sustainable diamonds. Um, and so while it integrates um, all of the sort of um, best practice approaches to the ESG standards and ethical stewardship, um, to climate neutrality, um, to various life cycle assessments and sustainable investments. In addition to that, they also wrap our technology um, within the process to make sure that the diamonds that will ultimately get to the consumer, carrying a certification to say these are ethically and sustainably lab-grown diamonds, that they've actually come from these sources. So we're routinely testing products at the wholesale level, at the cutter level and the retail level to make sure that those supply chains have integrity. Um, and that the diamonds that are carrying those certificates have in fact come from those lab grown producers that SCS independently audit to that ESG standard. So we think that can help revolutionize and, and support, um, you know, that both not just the lab grown diamond industry, but also the natural grown diamond industry as some of the key participants look for um, better tools to drive transparency within their industry. Um, and quite excited about the program, relatively new, about to be sort of formally launched. So, you know, look out for, for, for announcements to come out on that. Um, and then what um, the final one I'll talk to, and this is where we talk to, um, the reason why provenance verification is so important is, you know, without, without you know, the, obviously you've got the ESG standard, but provenance is just as important to link it back to that standard. In this example, USA Rare Earth is a, is a United States business that's about to build um, a, a, a value chain within the United States that vertically integrates rare earth and other products into um, batteries and magnets that are used in electronic vehicles and, and renewable energy systems. Um, they're looking, um, they've got their own ESG standards that they want to meet. Um, they're also now looking for a third party certification or, or um, ESG um, um, global group to, 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 to validate that against. But what they did first before they looked at that was to say the most important thing that we have when we're procuring rare earths from around the world is that we can validate where they've come from. So they've created a supply chain integrity program that scientifically verifies the origin of all their rare earths as they procure them both from within America, but also around the world. Um, and then they'll then look at, at the same time, what ESG standards or certification body um, is aligned to into the type of standards that they're trying to meet. So this is where the supply chain integrity and provenance verification component actually sat in front of um, the ESG standard and the reason that Rare Earth you know, was able to do that because um, you know, they're not yet in production. So, so um, I'll probably stop there. That probably gives people enough indication around you know, what we do and, and, and some of the challenges that we're all working towards to fix. So yeah, happy to take questions. Great. Thank you so much, Grant. And uh, that was fantastic. Um, we're running out of time actually, but I want to ask you a question 
about a, the ASM sector, because this is something that comes up yeah. every time you speak about these provenance issues, is how do we ensure we just don't exclude uh, the yeah. ASM sector in this? Yeah, look, I think it's a great question. Uh, we think most importantly, what, our, what, what scientific provenance verification can do is to cost effectively um, validate chain of custody information. So, you know, traditional methods are very paper-based, lots of sort of independent audits, but no scientific testing makes delivering chain of custody under a paper-based audit method quite expensive. Our technology is, um, one is scientific, but it's also very, very scalable. And so we think we can help validate chain of custody information in a much more cost-effective way. And therefore, it's more cost-effective for artisanal miners to be supported in this program. You know, the less cost of compliance to deliver to a standard, you know, the, the easier it is for, for, you know, for artisanal miners to support. So we see this as a tool for inclusion and, mm -hmm. and absolutely not exclusion. We're giving now, you know, people procuring these materials a, a more cost-effective tool to safely go in and procure uh, materials from artisanal miners. Thank you, Sarah, you look like you have a question. Um, no, just to say thank you so much for this grant and just to make it really well aware that, um, you know, there are many, many different tools and techniques and etc that are out there and grant I think your case studies that you gave us at the beginning of your talk were absolutely brilliant. Um, and um, just to make sure that um, we are sharing as many different tools and techniques different companies that do all of this as possible which is which is brilliant but do feel free of course to go and check out Source certain. Um, but there are there are uh, there are lots of different avenues into this as well but that's absolutely Absolutely brilliant grant thank you so so much thank you fantastic a round of applause i think behind our screens thank you so much grant for joining us we are now moving to south africa teresa um it, it you are up next and um, the talk is guiding esg integration to mineral resource reporting so i'm gonna hand over to you remember to unmute and people keep the questions coming. We have a really active uh, chat uh, going on. So keep that going, please, on YouTube and all the channels. Uh, Teresa, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, for some reason, my um, I wanted to switch my views and now it didn't let me. Um, okay you can help with here let me stop sharing sorry guys this worked perfectly earlier on of course right. um i will share the other screen so just while just while Teresa is sharing her screen here, so also just to jump in with you on this, because I know that Teresa is very technologically savvy. Um, Teresa is bringing to us um, one of the, the first organizations that actually managed to truly incorporate ESG into the minerals. So where we get the, the rocks out of the ground and as geologists and geoscientists, we report to the world how much rock is actually there, how much useful rock. So the volume and also the concentration or the grade of that rock. Um, and in South Africa, so the code that is in South Africa, and I'm sure Teresa will explain this uh, much better than I ever could, um, managed to incorporate a guideline on this as to how do you really get ESG to be incorporated into the, the calculations and also that financial disclosure. The exciting thing that has been happening over the last 12 months, really, is that um, in Europe, so PERC, which is the European guideline that we have, um, has um, managed to also upgrade, I should say, or review their own code um, and um, or standard, I should say. So, so the Europeans have gone for it, very much learning from all of the experience from the South Africans. Um, in parallel, the Canadians and the Australians um, are also going for big updates during 2021. I think everybody is taking the opportunity of COVID and people being trapped, even though nobody is less busy than we ever were, we're perhaps just not traveling so much, um, to update their own codes. Um, and through Crisco, which is um, the overarching umbrella really for many of these codes of how we do that reporting, um, has been coordinating this across the world. 
um, in terms of how do we make sure that we all learn from one another and so therefore make sure that when a geoscientist or a company says hey we've got the next biggest gold mine <laughs> underneath our feet we actually know what that is and we're not just talking about the minerals and the rocks in the ground we're also talking about the the the, the real ability to be able to extract those rocks so looking at the technical side so the engineering looking at the financial side so including the demand um, and also, of course, most importantly, perhaps including ESG as well. So with that, Teresa, I see that we have solved the computer gremlin. Um, I'm going to pass back to Orsa and yourself. Yes, Teresa, we are looking forward to this. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Sorry, guys, I have no idea what my computer just did. So long <laughs> moment. Um, yeah, so I've, I've spoken about the SAMES guideline before. Um, but just to, to give sort of those who haven't heard about it an update um, on, on where we are and what the guidelines are all about. So, so this, this figure, um, those who are in the, the mining industry and who are involved with reporting on, on rocks in the ground, uh, this figure is well understood uh, and it comes from, from the, the Crisco codes and, and all the, the various codes and standards that Sarah mentioned just now and apply this the same figure. And, and what it, it tells you is that as we increase the confidence in understanding the, the geology that's in the ground, and um, so we can classify the various rocks in, in, into different categories, and that gives um, potential investors and the, the owners of the mineral resource confidence in, in how much rock they, they can potentially mine. Um, now, there's two important factors or concepts within the, the mineral reporting world. Um, and these are what's called RPEEE, which is a, a concept that tells you how much, well, is the rock in the ground potentially viable? Could you, could you extract it and could you sell it? Um, and in determining that, a whole lot of assumptions need to be made, uh, which the, the people who are doing the reporting need to declare in their reports. And environmental, social, and governance come within that, that umbrella. Um, and the other concept is modifying factors. So if you are trying to determine whether the resource in the ground could be economically mineable, then you apply various modifying factors to it. Sarah was talking through some of those now. You know, do we know how to mine it? Do we know how to process it? Can we sell it? Um, and what are the, the ESG considerations around it? And these concepts get applied at specific points in the, the reporting process. Now, I have taken poetic license and, and modified the figure one that you, you saw just now um, to sort of illustrate, particularly in the exploration phase, there are distinct phases within that process, um, which can and do have um, particular impact because as you become, as you undertake invasive work, then you, you start having boots, uh, boots on the ground and you can potentially create environmental and social impacts. But once you've gone through that exploration process, that's when you need to apply this RPEEE concept. And it's very important at that stage that all of the assumptions that could influence the eventual economic extraction are clearly described. Again, once you're in the mineral resources phase and you're trying to firm that up to declaring mineral reserves, you apply the modifying factors. And depending on the confidence that you have in those modifying factors, you either end up with approved or probable mineral reserve. Now, this process is really one well understood. And if we take this as an example of a, a mining life cycle on the left, we sort of start with the, the pre-exploration phase. You should probably have um, some houses and some people there for it to be even more technically correct. But you move from left to right over the, the mining life cycle from doing your exploration, constructing, operating the mine, doing some processing, creating waste, um, rehabilitating and ending up in theory with some kind of a positive legacy at the end of the day. So overlaying that with the, the mineral reporting phases, um, a lot of that work is done and needs to be done before you can even um, start your construction process and then during the life of mine you typically most mines will look for resources that are nearby to where they're located so there'll be some kind of ongoing exploration process 
and increasing hopefully the, the mineral resources and the mineral reserves. But all of this geological process takes place in a certain context and um, which presents both risks and opportunities. So if we just think of some of the environmental risks that come up during the process uh, in green here, these are some of the things that, that need to be considered, whether it's your carbon footprint, what are the ecosystem services in the area, what's happening in terms of water and sensitive habitats. If we look from an, a social perspective, how could the mine contribute to community investment? Can it create jobs? What happens if people move into the area? Um, and from a, a governance perspective, we're looking at things like, but what are the skill sets of the board and the people who are going to be working on the mine? Are we paying tax in the right place at the right time? Are we paying people the right money? Um, have we got the right permits in place? And so this context becomes very important and overlays and should be influencing the, the resource and reserve determinations. So if we try and distill that down into something that looks a little bit more organized, um, in the planning phases, you need to put a lot of effort into understanding what your activities are going to, what, what activities you want to do and need to do, and what the impacts are, are likely to be. Because over time, you shift from that, that planning process into the doing process, and that's when you can create the impact. And so what Sam is, is asking of the, the mining industry is to understand and recognize all of these potential planning requirements, the activities and the impacts, and to distill that into the mineral reporting. So that we say, well, we understand all of this, but actually what does that mean? So what, where does the guideline sit? Uh, SAM codes, as Sarah explained earlier, is one of many international codes and standards, which sits underneath the Crisco family of, of codes on mineral reporting. And SAM codes has three main codes underneath it. Um, SAM REC, which is the mineral reporting code. SAM VAL relates to valuation of mineral resources. And SAM AUG is the oil and gas code. And SAM is, sits, which is the environmental, social, and governance guideline, is there to support SAM REC and SAM VAL. And we're still working on integrating into SAM AUG. It's, it, the processes in oil and gas are obviously quite different um, for reporting on um, resources compared to, to SAMREC and SAMVAL, and so that's a, a, a continuous work in progress. So the guideline really talks to helping the mining industry understand factors which can influence the RPEEE and the economic mineability of the resource. It was launched in 2016 and comprises of nine components at the moment, um, which, which talk to material, environmental and social modifying factors. We're busy working on version two, and so hopefully by the time we have next year's conference, we can give you some more insight into what version two looks like, because we realized that being a guideline, it has a lot of technical substance, but doesn't necessarily give enough guidance on, on the integration um, and the distillation that we want to see from, from mining companies. So our, our approach in, in the second version is really going to be saying, well, for each of these mineral reporting phases, what should the ESG focus be um, within each of those? What are the things that we should be looking at that's most pertinent to, to that particular phase? And with due cognizance of the, the work that will come later, and what does it actually mean for the project? So we draw on a lot of uh, the sustainability frameworks that exist um, we heard a bit earlier on from Geraldine about some of these frameworks. And so we're trying to say that, well, we recognize that there's a lot of work going on internationally. Some of these frameworks came out since um, the, the SAMES was first published. We know that there's a lot of work to try and align the various frameworks um, and to, to integrate it formally into or have a, a similar IFRS kind of international standard. And so we're trying to draw on all of these into to the next version of SAMES whilst making it practical for the end users to say, okay, but what does this actually, what does this mean for my project? Um, you know, oh, there's a, a sensitive species that lives three kilometers away. What does that mean for us um, as, as a project? And what does that mean for the, the mineral resources and mineral reserves that we were trying to decay? Um, so yeah, happy to take any questions, just a, a short and sweet overview of, of this particular guideline. And as Sarah says, all the various codes and standards are doing their best at the moment to integrate ESG 
in a way that makes sense to them um, into their various codes and standards. Um, and it's, it's a very exciting space to be in, to see how everyone is, is trying to make this, this more practical um, and a more obvious requirement for, for each of these, these mineral reporting codes, because it's, it's not only about you know, how much rock is in the ground, it's about everything that goes around it and that determines whether or not you have a resource or a reserve. So happy to take any questions. Excellent, Teresa. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question coming in here asking if the approach is comparable with the UNFC, which is the United Nations Framework uh, Classification for Resources. Yes, so it is, and the focus is slightly different. So the UNFC is really focusing at a, a country level, and that's where it's most applied. Uh, mining companies will, will follow the, the Crisco template that UNFC looks at a nation's inventory of mineral resources um, and their recent um, sessions, um, there was a lot of discussion around how to integrate sustainability into that classification and they've got quite a, a developed framework uh, that, that talks to, to considering environmental um, particularly um, considerations into, into that classification. But the, the focus is slightly different. Um, in the UNFC is at, at a national level compared to a, a specific company asset. So one question I had is, what is the business case for mining companies to, to look at ESG this early on already at the exploration phase? So if we, if there's many answers to that question, um, but I'll, I'll take one that's aligned with the purpose of, of the SAM codes and, and Crisco in, in particular, is these codes exist because we want to, um, mining companies want to attract investment, right? So that's why the codes are there, so that there's some kind of uniformity across the industry. So if company A says, oh, my mineral resource is X or my mineral reserve is Y, then there's some kind of common commonality across and meaning behind those definitions so that investors have confidence to put their money in. Investors, we know, want to understand what the ESG risks are related to a particular mining company. And so the business case for, first of all, complying with the, the Crisco codes, complying with SAM codes, complying with um, the SAMES guideline is that you're meeting what your investors are asking you for. Um, yes, they can go and um, try and trawl your website and see if they can find anything. We're trying to make it the reporting more blatant, more, um, more transparent because investors have a particular need and information that they're looking for because they're under pressure from the people who are giving them money to make sure that their money is responsibly invested. So, so that particularly within the mineral reporting phase, that's the business case, mm. is, is if you want money from your investors, you need to tell them what you're doing in the ESG space. And do you feel that the companies have the skills to, to implement this? some better than others. Um, I think it's an evolving space, particularly in the South African context. Um, our chair of the, the overarching SAM code standards committee is, is very good at reminding all of us that the work that we need to do needs to be applicable to the junior miner. Um, mm -hmm. Because the, the guys with the big bucks, the multinational mining companies, They've got the money to pay for the resources to, to bring in a heap of consultants to do their reporting and stuff for them. Um, but the junior guys don't always have those skills. And that's why, particularly within SAMES, we're really trying to make it more, include a lot more guidance so that if you are a geologist working for, for a junior mining company and it's really only you who has to do all of this, sorry, there's a motorbike driving past, um, that, that you have some guidance on where to, to find information um, to, you know, to prepare these reports to attract your investors. Mm. And we have one question here uh, that is, which is the best code to follow? South African, Canadian, Australian, European, etc. I mean, you're maybe a little bit biased, but <laughs> go ahead. No, well, put it this way, all the codes need to align with Crisco. And Crisco has a standard set of definitions and fundamentally each of the codes requires similar, similar things. Every time one of the codes does an update, for example, Perth has been updating their standard at the moment. One of the requirements of being a Crisco affiliated standard is you need to ask all the other codes to provide input. So, 
So fundamentally, I think they're all the same. Certainly within SAM codes, we're aware of some of the improvements that we're trying to make. We're really trying to get ESG more explicitly integrated into SAMREC, into the table one of SAMREC. So I think fundamentally, everybody's trying to achieve the same thing. Um, you, depending on different jurisdictions, you, you find a code that you, you can work with and that you're more familiar with. Obviously, in South Africa, we're very proud of the fact that we're the first country to have a formal ESG guideline. We've won a, a UN ISAR award for our guidelines. So, so we are very proud of that fact. Um, but the other codes are also doing the, you know, their share to, to bring everyone in alignment. I think something as important as, as ESG is something that the codes, hopefully in time, will become more aligned on as they have in term, you know, for definitions, for example, and, and, and the table one. Um, so I think we, we're all moving in the same direction. Fantastic. That was excellent. So, so much interesting information. And there are much more resources on that. You can check out the website for, for that. So a round of applause. Thanks, everyone. Um, we are quickly moving on here. Um, Lawrence, you are up next. If you can unmute and prepare your PowerPoint. And the topic is minimizing environmental impact to maximize environmental creden credentials. So I'm going to leave it to you to introduce yourself and uh, take it away. Perfect. Thank you. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Cool. Okay. Well, this morning I'm going to be talking about uh, the E part of the ESG toolbox, and that's mainly the, the environmental part. And what I'm going to be talking about is how you can minimize your environmental impact to maximize your environmental credentials. And um, why is this specifically important? Um, I'm sure everyone here has heard about this whole green agenda, uh, decarbonization trends, and even though it also is an opportunity for mining companies in terms of the uh, raw materials required, it's also a major risk, especially the lack of decarbonization. And for example, uh, legislation associated with the green agenda. And what we're seeing quite a lot recently is that um, a lot of uh, junior mining projects are, look, are, are integrating unsub unsubstantiated green credentials to boost their, the, the way their projects are perceived. So to give you a few examples, some of my personal favorites, what they, how they describe their projects, uh, lower CO2 emissions, low carbon technology, minimum water use, environmentally friendly and sustainable. And the thing that we probably ask ourselves on a daily basis is, but have they actually done a life cycle assessment? Um, and now to kind of talk about what a life cycle assessment is, or also an, an LCA, um, basically what it is, it's an inventory of the, the both the global and the local environmental impacts related to a uh, producing a product or a process to produce a product. And the image that you see here on the right is a bit of a schematic figure. What we then look at, we look at all the inputs going into a process and all the outputs to produce what we then call uh, the main product or the functional units to, to um, talk a bit, uh, bit in jargon. Um, and a life cycle assessment tends to include a range of environmental impacts. So the most popular one at the moment is the, the carbon intensity. And I'll be talking about for the majority of that for this presentation. Um, but water use also is gaining more traction. Um, and what I personally really like about doing an LCA is that it doesn't, doesn't just provide you, uh, the, for example, the carbon footprint of your product, but it also provides you insights into like the environmental hotspots of your process. So for example, if you look at the different processes that we see here in the middle, um, you, can, you can look at the uh, different energy and raw materials required for certain unit processes. And in that way, you identify the environmental hotspots in your process and with that, you can again uh, look into perhaps any mitigation strategies. And in that way, we get the raw materials required for this low carbon economy that we all talk about at actually minimum environmental impact. So the way that we see it is that understanding, quantifying and mitigating those impacts uh, by using lifestyle assessment is probably uh, scientifically the most robust methodology uh, to, to underpin the, the environmental pillar of the ESG triangle. And so let's talk about the carbon footprint. Um, because this is quite well reported on in the mining industry at the moment. Um, but the mining industry usually talks a bit more about the foreground processes. Uh, that's what they call a greenhouse gas analysis. And what they tend to differentiate in, uh, especially for uh, the greenhouse gases, are the scope one, two, and three emissions. And scope one emissions are the impacts associated with, for example, direct combustion of fuels on site, 
So think about, uh, for example, uh, the diesel consumed by a Hollis fleet. Um, scope 2 emissions, you look at, the, uh, for example, the embodied carbon footprint of the, the electricity that you consume on site. And scope 3 emissions, those are usually not reported upon. And, um, but they are an inherent part of, of doing a life cycle assessment. And um, if, for example, if we look at the, the figure that we have here on the bottom, um, scope 3 emissions can be both upstream or downstream scope 3 emissions. And what we tend to look at uh, and what we think all mining companies should kind of think about are also the upstream scope three emissions because then you're looking at the embodied impacts associated with the materials that you use to produce your kilogram of, of copper cathode for example and in the same way that we are currently saying that uh, for example a tesla needs to have a low carbon footprint for the batteries in that way a mining company should think about the the the, the environmental footprint of the regions that they are using so the way that we see it uh scope one two and upstream scope three impacts are the responsibility of the miner and the downstream scope three impacts are not the responsibility of the miner. Um, and I think in a previous presentation, I was really happy to hear Teresa talk about uh, integrating the ESG metrics already as early on as possible, because I couldn't agree more. Because um, what you see here, for example, is that from the moment, what you see here is the, um, the development stages that, that the uh, resource project will go through. Um, and actually from the moment that you move into construction, the odds are of you influencing or changing anything in your process or project setup, it's gonna be minimum because you've spent uh, all this capital to build a mine. You're not gonna add any additional risk by trying any reagents. You're not gonna spend an additional few million dollars to get some renewable energy sources because you need to get your return on investment. So by integrating the, these life cycle assessment metrics uh, throughout the different development stages of a project, you actually have the possibility to to get this these these environmental these these quantitative environmental impact data to supplement, for example, your, your production volumes and the costs associated with that. So the way that we see it, you probably from the moment you, you design your first flow sheet, you're doing a scoping study. That's when you also should carry out your first life cycle assessment. Um, and now, what I'll quickly I'll walk through uh, through a case study. Um, this is an example that we've done for uh, a lithium project in development. And um, what we're going to be looking at is uh, producing at the life cycle impact of producing one kilogram of, of a lithium product uh, from the same deposit using two different flow sheets. And what we see here on the right is what we call uh, the system boundary. So these are uh, two different routes that we're looking at. And uh, the first route, we're looking at a hydrometallurgical flow sheet uh, where the, uh, the ore is, uh, is leached, the impurities are removed, and the product is precipitated. And basically the second flow sheet, the one that you see in, in the brown color is uh, quite identical, but there's a concentrating step in the middle, which means that we're removing some waste before we go into the hydrometallurgical process. Um, and a small disclaimer, I won't be talking about the impact of the mining stage just yet, um, because usually people tend to design a process first and then they build uh, the mine plan around that. Um, so if we look at the what contributes to the, the carbon footprint of the uh, one kilogram of lithium product for route one, we can see that more than 70% of the impact actually comes from upstream scope three emissions. And that, just to remind you, that's the embodied impact of the used reagents. And these are the values that currently mining companies are not reporting on. And that's, I think, is, is quite, quite, uh, quite mind-blowing. Um, so the direct emissions for their scope one account for about 20% of the, the uh, carbon footprint of the lithium product and the, um, the uh, utility, the impact of the utilities, uh, they account for about 90% uh, of the impact. And this shows then the, the, the importance of understanding these, these upstream scope three emissions uh, when you're developing a project. Uh, it doesn't just influence the, the, the OPEX, so the costs of producing your lithium, but it also really influences the environmental credentials. So now let's take a look at how it then compares if we're uh, looking at the, the carbon footprint of the upgraded ore versus the non-upgraded ore. Now what you can see from this figure on the right is that for the upgraded ore, um, the, the carbon footprint is less than half than it is for the, the carbon for, compared to the carbon footprint of the, the upgraded ore. And the majority of the savings actually originate from a reduction in the amount of reagents that are required. Uh, so if we compare this against the original scenario, the relative contribution decreases from 71% to 26%. Um, and I already mentioned that in this case, we haven't included the, the, uh, the say, the impact associated with, for example, the, the fuel used in the mining stages or the explosives that are used. 
So um, realistically, most likely the impact of the upgraded ore will uh, increase, uh, won't be half, less than half what it would be of the non-upgraded ore, because we'll lose some material in our concentration process, which means that we'll need to linearly increase uh, the amount of fuel required to hold ore and, and to loosen it, for example, with explosives. Um, and actually what we're seeing at the moment is that uh, using life cycle assessment in critical metal project development is getting more and more uh, recognition. And just to go through a few examples. So probably one of the most famous one in Europe at the moment is from a project uh, owned by Vulcan Energy Resources. So they're producing battery grade lithium hydroxide, lithium being a, a metal critical for the energy transition, um, while simultaneously exporting, electri uh, exporting electricity to the German grid. And by, by doing that, Using LCA, it actually shows that uh, the carbon footprint of the product is negative. Um, another very interesting case that, that uh, we've seen is um, where they produce uh, vanadium pentoxide from, from steel, uh, steel slag waste. And what I think is really interesting about that project is that they sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and add it into the process as a reagent. Um, and by doing this, uh, they also have a carbon footprint uh, of their, their project that's negative. Um, and uh, talking about a different critical metal, uh, nickel, um, there's currently a project in development where they're using what they call uh, a new innovative process called the, called the uh, direct nickel process, where they're producing better grade nickel sulfides from laterite ores. And what they're trying to do is to, they're trying to get uh, the, the, the uh, natural gas for their thermal energy. They're trying to capture that um, from, from methane that would normally be uh, directly emitted, so what they call vented into the atmosphere. And they receive a credit for that, which gives them the opportunity also to have a very low or negative product carbon footprint. Um, and definitely make sure to, to, to watch uh, Minvirus uh, LinkedIn or, or follow us, uh, check out our website, because in the short term, we'll be working with a major um, software uh, mine planning uh, company to integrate these metrics into their mine planning and mine optimization to gain uh, as early on as possible, like the life of mine insights into these environmental impacts. Um, so I've been mainly talking about uh, the, the, uh, the global warming potential of the, or the carbon footprint over the last few minutes. But it, what I really like about life cycle assessment is that, is that it quantifies all the different possible environmental impacts. Um, some of them are not as relevant for mining as, as others are. For example, the ones that are in orange aren't as relevant. They're mainly relevant for the chemical industry. But the ones in green are relevant. So in this case, a global warming potential, they're already talked about also particulate matter. So looking at, for example, the, the effects on human health. Um, also looking at acidification, and this is mainly really relevant for, for sulfide minerals, um, but also land use. We already talked about mine closure earlier on today, but also water use, which is becoming more and more important. Um, and what we are currently working on, it's not finished just yet. We're working on a state-of-the-art LCA tool that can help, that can really supplement this ESG toolbox. It's a platform called Mine LCA. And what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, basically everyone can have access to lifecycle thinking into uh, project development as early on as possible. And they don't need to hire an expensive uh, LCA consultant for that, but they can actually get these quantitative and environmental metrics as early on as possible. Um, and as it says here, and that way you get life cycle uh, thinking enabled for all. Um, and I'm, I'm personally a really big fan of making these environmentally informed decisions because you can, by using this, this LCA scenario analysis, you can look at your different project options. You can evaluate the impacts in the full life cycle context. And you can use this data to, to really supplement the decision-making uh, for the technical and economic data that you already have. And I think a really cool trend that we've recently been noticing is that um, a lot of companies are having the interest of, of integrating this data in their sustainability reporting, but also in their, uh, the, the reporting that they're doing for their um, the resource projects and development, for, the, for example, using following the Your guidelines or the NI43-101 guidelines. And I think that's a really cool development. Um, and now, I guess, going back kind of to the title slides, um, by using this LSA approach within the ESG context, you can indeed minimize your environmental impact at maximum flexibility. And in this way, really uh, selecting the least, and, uh, the least environmentally impactful route and maximize the environmental component of your ESG triangle. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Tasting, I've learned, uh, is your last <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Fantastic. Um, you can't manage what you can't measure. Um, that's sort of absolutely. The <laughs> um, we have. I'm going to start with a question from Dan on YouTube. Um, I'm going to read it here. Scope three emission reporting seems really poor and really variable across mining all metals. Are the GHG protocols and GRI type standards too flexible on this? Some companies publish methods, at least. Um, that's a really interesting question. I wouldn't say it's too flexible just yet. Um, I guess it's about companies and, and uh, people getting used to it themselves as well. As in, it's been, we've come from a long way where we didn't even talk about uh, scope one or scope two emissions. So what we tend to notice is that the world is moving in that direction. But to make sure that you get everyone on board at the same time, you need to take baby steps. Um, so I think in the future, as life cycle assessment and upstream scope three emissions become more important, people will get more aware of it. I think maybe the, the, the guidelines will become more tight in that as well. Um, but it's about making sure that the companies can, can you know, move in the right direction. And they're big and they, they need time for this. And I think they're not too flexible, but, but they're getting in the right direction. And we have another one here from Haluk. Um, there are many regulations. I mean, these are great questions, so I'm just going to keep reading what people are sending in here. Um, there are many regulations about EIA and this has been updated by country uh, to country. Um, also, LCA has some limits and scopes based on these regulations and projects aim. So how can we manage or analyze LCI? Is there any national standards or applicable base checklist for projects? Um, unfortunately, not yet. And mm -hmm. that's really quite frustrating. So if you look at the LCA guidelines, these are uh, global ISO standards. Um, what you notice is that there's a lot of flexibility that's been given to the LCA practitioner, so the person carrying out the, LCI, uh, the LCA. Um, so actually one thing that, that we are working on with uh, certain uh, global LCA, uh, uh, say, uh, the communities, is what we call development of a product category rule, which basically is a set of guidelines of what you should and shouldn't include in an LCA, which can then be third-party ver verified to make sure that actually the decisions you've made align with the standards set out um, for, for these different, different uh, LCA methodologies. Um, so also there, unfortunately, we're not there yet. Um, however, there are some movements where people are going to do this, for example, for lithium, for graphite, um, because these, the, having data for it is, is really important. Um, to, to answer your question about the environmental impact assessment, um, so the way that we see it, so LCA is quite good at capturing impacts on a global level, a bit less on a regional scale. And that's why, where the EIA comes in really handy and the two really should support each other and not exclude each other out. Mm -hmm. And for the audience, it, Sarah is sort of typing all the abbreviations, what they mean if it's too much jargon. So, so keep a check on that if, if you feel like you're getting lost, EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment. Um, Lawrence, one thing that I, I was just thinking of is a lot of companies are now, they have sort of a net zero target when it comes to, to carbon emissions in, well, 2050 or something like that. What do you think about that as a target for the industry? Uh, great. In the end, it's about making the statement to make sure that they are going to commit to it. I think realistically, they will initially do it to, to please their shareholders and to make sure that the communities they work in know what they're doing. Um, and then the next thing they do is that they're going to try and figure out how they're going to get to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's a really positive development because it means that they are going to commit capital and resources to, to gaining these insights as they're moving towards that net zero strategy. But one important thing to keep in mind is that because uh, we've been involved with some of these projects as well, is that they're then looking at being net zero in terms of scope one and scope two, and not as much yet scope three. So the, um, I guess if every company moves towards net zero for scope one and scope two themselves, we will be. Um, but I think it's of course important to understand uh, that the companies are aware of their responsibilities from that perspective as well. Mm. And why do you think the critical metals companies are more interested in, in these issues than maybe some other companies? um the, the the money that's associated with it i think if they can they know what the if they know they are the minimum impact uh deliver if they deliver the minimum impact products of the industry mm -hmm. they are going to be able to get a premium price compared to the other uh the other metals out there or they're going to be able to set up long-term supply agreements um in the end everyone's pointing towards electric mobility as being the the savior of the world um but the issue is that a lot of lca studies that have been carried out to prove this 
are based on outdated data sets. So they don't really have this insight yet on this full uh, supply chain. So if they want to get the attention of a Volkswagen, they want to get the attention of a Tesla, they need to have this data. So that those are the first areas where these steps are being made. But I think for the other commodities, it become more important as well. So fantastic. This is really a topic to keep a close eye on. It's getting more and more uh, topical. Uh, thank you so much for a brilliant presentation and uh, answering all our difficult questions. A round of applause, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. We are quickly moving on. Um, I am really enjoying this. I hope you are too. Um, Julie and Zach from the uh, BK Advisory is up next. So please uh, unmute and all of that. Uh, and uh, the headline here is from principles to practice the SDGs as a unified framework for organizational value, risk and performance. So if you are ready, uh, please take it away. I think it's Zach starting here. No. And I think you need to unmute. It is. Thank you. I'm sorry. You know, after all our practice this morning and being on time and everything, and then I completely lapsed it in the moment. Um, Thank you. Thanks very much for that intro. And hi, hi, everyone. Uh, our um, discussion today takes a little step back from, I think, some of the discussions that we've been having this morning, uh, which have been great. Um, and we just want to move to a slightly more abstracted level around uh, the same discussion, really, about how we're drawing together, how we making sure that we're sharing information in a way that is uh, sensible, that is uh, easy to communicate, um, and that has a good a good narrative, or a worthwhile narrative around it. And, and one of the first things that we want to talk about is just this idea of a, uh, a VUCA world, which, which I, I'll be honest, I only heard about uh, a few months back for the first time, but uh, and so if, if everybody's very well aware of this, I apologize, but really this idea that, you know, that the world has been uh, kind of volatile, changed very rapid and uncertain. It's been uncertain, uh, unpredictable, sorry, and it's been uncertain. Um, the present is unclear and the future is quite uncertain. Uh, it's been complex, it's been ambiguous. And I think that these are words that we've, we've all kind of come to know and come to feel over the last number of years. But, but really, we're actually shifting away from that. And that's really how the world was. Uh, and there's, there's a new acronym, of course, everybody loves an acronym. There's a new acronym that's kind of making the rounds at the moment, which is that it's more banny now. Instead of being Buka, it's more banny, which is that it's brittle. I think we're, we're recognizing, and certainly I think the last year and a half have brought this home incredibly strongly, uh, that systems break. And they can break like this, you know, uh, and we need to be more aware of these sudden shifts and sudden seismic events, if you like. I know there's always a lot of geologists on the call, so I'm going to uh, casually throw in geologically, geological terms and misuse them the whole way through. Um, it's also anxious. It's very anxious for us. I think a lot of us are dealing with a lot of kind of trying to understand what the world might look like at the moment, but also for our stakeholders. Uh, and certainly, I know that in the mining industry, um, we've seen in South Africa, uh, and I, you know, we're seeing all around the world, certainly South America a lot, there's this increasing anxiety around, well, what does the future look like for me? Um, and how can I, as uh, somebody in a vulnerable situation, navigate some of that? And it can be quite difficult to remain positive. Uh, and it can be quite difficult to understand whether you have any ability to make decisions. And part of this is because it's become more non-linear. Uh, and so we recognize and can see that the world's kind of um, cause and consequence structure that we're so used to, uh, of course, hasn't gone away completely, but it's certainly uh, not as easily accessible as it uh, maybe once was. And particularly, I think, when we're dealing in social performance and stakeholders, and that's some of what we've been hearing this morning as well. Um, you know, we, we're, we're trying, to, trying to control and trying to manage for a space that's really, uh, really fluffy and really, um, really nuanced and careful. 
And finally, it can feel incomprehensible. You know, this nonlinear nature uh, can make things seem genuinely random and, and seem like they're jumping about. And I guess that what this comes down to for all of us uh, is how do we create a space where we are better able to respond and better able to understand some of these things in a world that's shifting all the time? Um, and you'll, you'll forgive me some bad puns as we go through this when I talk about shift happens. But let's talk about what this means for us as businesses, uh, as the mining industry, as various other industries. <coughs> One is it means that there's, there's this increasing accountability and, and, and there's a real shift uh, towards allegiance um, of companies that present a fuller value to society. And it was interesting what Lawrence was saying now about the IPA. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, not about the IPA, about LCA. Um, you know, that, that, that customers and customers of customers, and we'll come back to this, but they really are demanding that uh, organizations, mining in particular, but many organizations are behaving uh, in a way that they feel is more responsible. They're also tagged to that, obviously amplifying their voices. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> we love to jump on on about how social media is the amplification effect here, but it really, it really has been, it's been incredible. And those amplified voices also mean that people with a more niche ax to grind, if you like, uh, are able to get their voice out much more. And so that's, that's led, I think, recently we can see to a lot of the um, increased tensions uh, that exist uh, and a lot more of the kind of uh, polarization of people's opinions and, and, and views because you want to be, not want to be, but if you want to get heard, you kind of keep getting pushed out to the polls. And we've got a challenge, and this is an interesting one to put out, obviously, with this, the group the group sitting around the table here, but this question around, is ESG just another sticker? And I think, you know, that's a big challenge for all of us is how do we move from ESG being this thing where you check the boxes and you follow the standards, to actually, guys, this has to be a central part of what we do. This has to be deeply ingrained in who we are as organizations, as companies, as minds, and um, as people. And I think that's been a big challenge if we, if we think back 20, 30, 40 years when we talk about sustainability uh, and how it has moved slightly but at the end of the day, for many companies and many mines, it's still, here's what we do. We produce, we create this metal, we sell it, et cetera, et cetera. We dig a big hole in the ground. And we've got to do this ESG stuff because, you know, investors want to see it and our stakeholders want to see it. But is it central to who we are? Um, Hero-based responses is always one that I think is difficult to, uh, to get across briefly. For those people who know me will know I'm, I'm very anti-heroes. Um, heroes are great in, a, in an immediate crisis, but they don't avoid crises, okay? And I think that that's the key. Uh, and we've seen this certainly now during, during uh, COVID is there's a lot of people jumping up to be heroes, but actually not making systemic changes, right? And I think that that's, uh, that's quite central. So we need that ability to build a stable system rather than only respond as heroes in the crisis. And of course, we know that there are these increasing societal fault lines, again, throwing in a little bit of uh, poorly used geological terms there. Um, but really, those fault lines, are they exist. We're all very, very aware of them. What we aren't aware of and we don't know is at what point do they, do they shift, do they crack? I think we're seeing it more and more. I think we uh, we all somewhere in our gut know that this is happening more and more and more, but does it happen in a bigger way? Does it happen in a way that really starts shutting things down? Uh, and we've had, certainly in South Africa, we've had a couple of mines recently that have uh, had to stop production for periods of time due to societal um, uh, increases of violence or, or other protests and challenges. Uh, and I know that this is a global phenomenon. Um, and so finally, we need to understand that all of these things are interwoven. Uh, and so uh, once more, a poor pun, but about just the world is a mesh. Yeah? It's both a mess and a mesh. Uh, and we've got to start understanding much better the uh, interconnectedness of all of these things. 
Um, and I, I think, and this comes back to what I was talking about, about the, the uh, earnings in ESG, is we, we've we decoupled them. So we've said, look, earnings, that's important for us. And ESG, that's kind of on the side. And it's also important, but it's important differently. And actually, we need to start drawing those back together. So the first way that we need to do that, <coughs> well, the first thing that's important is looking at the scope and understanding that it's not simply about our core operations or even our core operations and value chain. But in fact, our community and social investment, our public advocacy and policy, partnerships and collaboration, all of this is the scope of what we do. Uh, um, you know, and we spoke earlier, somebody mentioned about, uh, I think it was Teresa mentioned about large mines and small mines. Absolutely true. You know, the big mines throw lots of money right across this chain. Uh, but the fact is, every mine needs to be thinking about this entire chain because and every business needs to be thinking about this chain because how do we fit in across that? And we're being challenged by a lot of people who care and they care a lot. You know, government is challenging more and more and more and, and uh, you know, is, is pushing back harder um, on irresponsible practices. Um, <coughs> and in many cases, uh, you know, um, we're seeing new regulations coming up and we need to be thinking about future regulations our customers and our customers' customers. And that comes back to that kind of, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence thinks about the um, LCA, about the life cycle analysis. You know, we've been working a little bit with the, the platinum industry as an example, where uh, the manufacturers are being challenged by their customers. And so they're pushing that up the line, right back to the mines to say, guys, you know, what are you doing? I mean, how uh, are you... Um, are you mining responsibly? Are you approaching all of this responsibly? And of course, you know, we can talk about things like uh, platinum and uh, some of the larger larger mines, but when you've got children mining cobalt, you know, that's used in all of our cell phones, we're not tracking that very well. And so that's where I think that uh, um, initiatives like uh, Source Certain, I think are amazing, you know, and a very number of them and very, very important is that we need to be able to look at that entire chain and see where things are. Investors are pushing harder uh, for ESG, and that's, yeah, there's responsible investment, uh, but actually investors in total, and we'll come back to it, but but it's it's fundamental to them because it reduces our risk, uh, it covers our exposure, et cetera. Um, activists and advocacy and civil society, and all of these, this is the problem, is that they all see value in different parts of that chain and in different places, all right? And so we come back to needing a couple of key things. One of the things we need is a common language. Uh, we need objectives that aren't exclusionary. <clears throat> Sorry, and when I talk about a common language, Geraldine brought it up right at the front. There's so many standards, okay? And we can all pick a standard and that's great, but actually we need a way to talk across those standards as well uh, and to collect to collectively discuss these things. We need a, a guiding star and I put moral compass in that because I, I, I'm aware that uh, you know, as soon as you start bringing morals in, people go, well, that's not that's not about business. You know, business isn't about that. Oh, it's about morals, but it's really about producing or mining or digging big holes. And but actually, we do need that. And it's important because it does help us reduce risk. It does help us increase transparency. And it does allow us, by having a guiding star, to walk our own route just in the same direction. I thought that was a lovely way that uh, Teresa mentioned it. She said, we're all moving the same way, or we should all be moving the same way. And so we end up needing this kind of meta framework that translates between all of these codes. And I think some of it comes back to the core of what it is that we're doing. And uh, we had uh, Dr. Raj Abedian speak at a, a conference earlier this year, and he, he had this lovely phrase. He said, the purpose of an economy is to ensure human flourishing. Um, and of course, we can, you know, we can say, well, environmental flourishing and all of those things come under the banner because if if the world is not flourishing. We will not flourish uh, once we take a broader view. And, and so one of the ways that we can try to help these uh, different uh, stakeholders or different people who care kind of see this value and understand this whole picture is by drawing it together into a couple of clear lenses and understanding clearer strategies and goals, having some better visibility of the data and being able to tell a stronger and, and a better narrative, one that's more defensible with actual data, with proper assurance behind it. We've been 
pretty good on this on the financial side, but pretty poor on this on the ESG side, if we're honest. And recoupling those and bringing those back together is essential. And so this is a drum I've been banging and we've been banging for a few years now. Um, but the sustainable development goals really cover that off very well. They cover all of the ESG uh, activities. They also cover financial activities. They cover human well-being. Um, they really are a collective that draws all of this value together very nicely. I am conscious of time, so I'm going to skim through a little bit, but I think there's some very key <clears throat> business imperatives to this as well around uh, being able to reduce risk and secure uh, business value and opportunity, uh, responding to stakeholders, strengthening license to operate, um, improving trust and creating effective partnerships, and a lot of internal synergies that come out of thinking about what we do in this way. And so these, there are various toolkits uh, around this. Um, one of the, the key things for any toolkit, we believe, is that you've got to draw together data mapping, the narrative, and strategy all into a central view, into a single view around unified value. Um, because otherwise, you end up in the same problem. You just end up with lots of different silos, and these guys are making money, and these guys are doing ESG, and these guys are doing community stuff. Uh, and actually, we don't get a, a, a clear understanding of what it is that we want to do. <coughs> and so if we think about that unified value framework, we could think about, or we should think about how we can do materiality assessments and that materiality flows into the framework. It says, well, where are we going to focus and where are the, the areas of risk that we must be conscious of, the categories, the bucket zones, whatever we want to call them, but where are the, where are the groups of risks uh, that we need to be aware of? And then once we're aware of that, and we've shared that, we've done that with our stakeholders, we've engaged them on that materiality assessment. We've got to be, they're going to say, okay, well, what are you doing about it now? And so we've got to be able to present this activity in a clear uh, manner that um, shows our activities on an ongoing basis, it shows our balance against risk, and we're able to present that and make that visible to increase transparency, but also internally can, uh, within companies, can start to guide ourselves and start to make sure that we are thinking about the whole range of activity. And all of this comes down, you know, we've got to have, uh, we use the SDG mapping to do this, um, but really what we want is this kind of uh, E and ESG narrative, so economic and uh, ESG all drawn together in a single way so that our executives uh, and our, um, our companies and our stakeholders uh, our investors, our local communities, everybody's having a view uh, through the same lens to understand what is going on. And in that way, we can now start to have some real uh, conversations and discussions um, at a much richer level so that people aren't being left out. Uh, and we're not doing it for me or for you. We're doing it for all of us. And we're aiming towards this kind of this common good idea. <coughs> some examples really and um, I guess about how we can start thinking about this our contribution to a prosperous South Africa in by using the SDGs we're able to see where some of our focus areas are uh, we're then able to deep dive into some of those by using them as this unifying framework and collectivizing you can start to look at okay well what have we been doing over the last number of years where has our focus been and where has it shifted over the previous number of years and um, are we more focused on economic, social? But now we're drawing all of these together. So uh, I'm very anti uh, the kind of the drive that for businesses must just be for the common good. Uh, if a business isn't financially sustainable, it doesn't work anyway. So you have to combine these things and you need to be considering all of them. And if you're not considering all of them together, then... Uh, you're going to focus on certain areas and miss the boat. And you will have different people focusing on different areas. Um, and I think that many of us will know, many of the people on this call will know and will have observed uh, challenges around that, around these kind of silos that get created. So how do you start to bring that across? Again, we think that the, the goals are really a good way to be able to bring that together. Um, and to be able to break that down and bring that into economics, 
uh, and see what's happening on the economic front. And then also how that links again back to the SDGs. And then you can bring that out into really well packaged um, and well structured views to say, all right, let us deep dive on each of these things. And so to be able to again use this kind of unifying framework that we could drive down, uh, dive down into, for example, green investments, and we could click on, on the SDG there and then get an unpacking of well, what's happening on that SDG, what are our different uh, initiatives, and drill down. All of this data, once you've got it into a framework, actually presenting it becomes a, a much simpler um, uh, situation. And I think, you know, a number of organizations, certainly we're working with a number of organizations, but there, there are many roads uh, at the moment. A number of organizations are starting down this road. Probably one that's gone quite far in, uh, in the mining industry, I think everybody is reasonably aware, but is Anglo-American. There's a very good case study uh, that was done last year um, by the Global Compact, which is available to go and have a look at how they've taken their, their sustainability, sustainable mining strategy. They've mapped the SDGs across their whole organization, and they've been able to use that to say, what are we doing? How are we achieving? And they use the SDGs on an ongoing basis now to monitor development and improvement. Um, and as I say, there's a great, uh, the link's there, but I, I'm sure as this gets emailed out, you'll be able to follow it. Um, a really good uh, deep dive on how they've, they've done it as one example of, uh, of good practice. Um, and so I'll leave you with one last really bad pun, which is let's go get Meshi. Uh, so. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, shift happens. I think it's going to be my new <laughs> life motto. Um, the first question that I've seen here is the SDGs are massive and also conflicting. So how do you navigate this? Uh, I, I know it's difficult to ask second questions or follow-up questions here, but I'm not sure how they're conflicting. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't have the questionnaire in front of me. Um, I'm thinking that some of, some of the SDGs are at least, you have to focus on one or the other, or can you focus on all of them at the same time? Um, well, okay, that, so that comes into an interesting point. I'm not convinced that it's about um, focusing on one to the exclusion of another. Okay, so I, I, sorry, I have a clarification here. Okay, go for it. <laughs> if you only solved climate change, you would negatively impact on human rights. I'm sorry, say that again, if you only? If you only solved climate change, you may negatively impact on human rights. Yeah, that's true. If you pick one and focused on that, then you may negatively impact on others. If you take a look at the whole mix, then you will do what you can in the spaces where you can. And you will be aware at least of where there are negative impacts, okay? And so you're able to now look at context and understand the whole context. And I think that's, I'm glad that the question came up because that's exactly our base proposition here is you can't just look at a single issue. You shouldn't be, this is part of, I think, what's led us to the space where we are into this kind of banny world is because we're all trying to solve, hero solve, single specific problems. We're not looking at the system, at the whole picture, at the underlying nuances. And I think that that is where the SDGs can really help us to draw all of that together. We have uh, Robin waiting for us now. Okay. I want to ask a, a short, a easy question. Is the mining industry better or worse when it comes to the systemic thinking than other industries? Uh, you see now that's so the mining industry is not a monolith uh unfortunately you know i think it's been my experience that the companies that are good at it are really good at it and i think are uh well ahead i think some other businesses are, are miles behind i don't want to have a dig at finance again but i'm going to i think finance is miles behind banking but uh i do think my, the mining industry is really uh in spaces very well ahead mm -hmm. but it's you know it's such a, 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 um, a heterogeneous industry, you know, there, there's still so much filth that goes on in the industry. There's no way about it. And um, I think we're getting better in mm -hmm. general. Great. Zach, thank you so much. You win the prize for puns, is what Sarah is saying. <laughs>
podcast. But <laughs> it's really is not clear. <laughs> Amazing. A round of applause. Yeah, thanks very much. so much. Um, Robin, you are here and you are ready. Uh, Robin from Isometrics. Uh, the title is ESG Toolbox for Responsible Sourcing. So um, if you just put your PowerPoint to use and unmute your microphone, then I will hand it over to you. Hi, thank you very much. So just checking you can uh, hear me and see my presentation. Absolutely, you're good to go. Great, thank you. So uh, hi everyone and, and thanks very much for this uh, opportunity. What I'll be uh, speaking on really is just be zooming in onto what a management system can do to, to help manage all your ESG data. So that's that's what I'm going to focus on. It's, it's the uh, type of offering our business does, but it's, uh, it's nice to share the experience I've had on, on actually what a management system can do with all this ESG data and reporting that's, um, that's needed these days. So the topics I'll touch on really managing that data, how you then can analyze and, and report to the required uh, reporting um, initiatives or requirements. And then some of the advantages that I'll share with you that an ESG management system can bring and then share also some of the lessons we've learned from a um, implementation. And there definitely are some lessons we learn as we go along. Okay, so, so firstly, just on the, uh, the data part. So it's important to realize right up front which, why you need to gather data and what get data you need to gather. Is it a specific reporting requirement, um, for a specific standard? Is it uh, just for your internal sustainability reporting? You know, what are the drivers for getting that data? So you've got to understand what is that right data that you need to gather. An important exercise also to undertake up front is understanding your material risks. And we've learned this as well, helping companies um, with, with managing ESG is, is understand those material risks that are relevant to your business and then make sure that the metrics related to those are gathered and that may well meet then some of those standards and some of those indicators within standards. So firstly, identify what data you need. And then where does that data reside and how do you acquire that data? Now, I think all of us who have... Um, worked with ESG or helped report with ESG or advised or consulted to, to businesses on ESG, realized that data gathering is a huge part of this exercise. And there's a range of maturity of businesses from those where data resides in many different systems, spreadsheets, uh, different sites, different departments to, to those that are actually have it more under control where it's much more centralized. But the point is, Acquiring data is taking up a huge amount of, of time. Uh, recent uh, experience we've had is uh, with a food company based here in South Africa is that the, the head of sustainability was saying that it takes him three weeks of the month just to gather the data to be able to report. And that's, that's not acceptable. So, you know, upfront, understand where this data resides, how, uh, what form this data is. Is it a continuous data that gets fed or is it sort of once or um, type of, of responses. And then, you know, where is that data stored? Is it warehouses? As I said, is it sort of separate spreadsheets and at different sites? So all of this needs to be understood before you can help an organization uh, combine this and, uh, and, and help them report and understand that data. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit later on about, it's not just about reporting, it's about uh, using that data, getting value out the data. Okay, and then as important is, and what we're seeing more and more questions about is, a, is, is the assurance or the quality aspects of that data. So the ability to, for a system to identify or pick up when data is not quite conforming perhaps to uh, previous sets of data or to preset thresholds or limits. And there's various ways that this can be done. It can. Uh, you, you know, uh, checks can be done against a variation and you can maybe set limits to the degree of variation you want uh, identified. 
you know, anomalies, maybe it's laboratory data for, you know, water laboratory data, for example, and uh, if there's a spike in a particular parameter, I mean, that is an anomaly that the system picks up and flags for you, you can go investigate, was it, uh, you know, legit or not. And also the ability that a system could perhaps alert or notify a relevant responsible person, and that, you know, that, that could be different people for different sets of, of data. So all of that is useful quality assurance that we are seeing companies asking more and more about. The last point um, I just want to touch on under the quality assurance, the collaboration and verification and, you know, experience that we've had even through, uh, through the various lockdown situations that I think most of us have been um, through is this collaboration has become a huge thing. You know, how do we collaborate and um, comment on information or a presentation or, or something remotely. And that same concept can be applied to data. You know, how do we, how can we comment, collaborate on a set of data to make sure it is correct, comment on it, um, and then obviously approve it by the right people. So collaboration is becoming, in our view, um, a very important thing. And then you move on to the security of the system. How secure is that data and who has access to it? And you can set different restrictions. So all of that, is important aspects to consider just regarding the gathering of data. And then it comes on to the reporting aspect. Now, it's not just about that data, it's also about being able to interpret it, analyze it and, and perform various functions. For example, you might be gathering and, and a lot has been spoken about uh, carbon, so we can stick with that trend. You know, What is your diesel consumption or electricity consumption, but that has to be turned into a carbon uh, dioxide footprint, a carbon dioxide equivalent, or, you know, your, your carbon footprint. And that's what needs to re be reported on. So the system will be useful to have some sort of computation components uh, or, or, or um, calculation engines behind it. Another example, just water consumption. You know, what are the inputs versus the outputs? Calculate that consumption because you're reporting um, asks for what is your consumption. And then the... Uh, added value, things like displaying that data, understanding trends, understanding your data against target sets so that visually you can really see what's happening. Now, this is now touching what I wanted to come back to or look back to is it's not just about reporting, it's also understanding your situation and getting value out of the data. And then we'll talk about the risks in a moment. So that's the interpretation part You get your uh, the generation of a report, and most companies just expect, you know, push a button, I want to see a report. It sounds very easy, it's not always that easy. Um, but understanding then what report is needed for their purposes. Is it a, um, a report, for example, a GRI related report, or is it more complex or simple than that? So the system, again, useful if it can generate that right type of outputs. The last point I put there just about viewing the data. Uh, Different levels within an organization would like to see different data. Perhaps it's you know, really the raw data at a site level or consolidated or rolled up for more of a corporate view. So again, different levels within an organization would like to see different aspects or interpretation of that data. So some of the advantages of a, let's call it a central management system or an ESG management system. It allows for the full process to be considered. So from gathering that data right through to the final reporting, viewing that data. Centrally, it's one system that, that data can be securely stored. You're, you're breaking down those silos between perhaps the different risk types between safety, environment, and health, so that it's more of a holistic view of all your risks. It does reduce that time consuming component of trying to gather data. Let me touch on, expand on that point. I mean, I'm as position here within my company in the sustainability, I've been tasked with helping our invest, uh, the investors in our company gather certain data. And I'm finding that very difficult within even our organization, looking at a, perhaps the HR system and the financial system to try gauge who's traveled where and, and, and so forth. And I'm finding that difficult and I can just imagine larger companies are finding it um, many times harder. So that this time of gathering data is a huge thing that uh, you know, needs to, to be overcome. And then on the risk side, so 
Then I just want to expand a little bit to say, it's one thing gathering data, reporting on data, but there has been a shift and, I, and I've definitely seen it where now we want to understand that data. So it loops back to basically your health, safety, environmental risks or your, your governance of the whole of your company. Use that data to understand those risks. At the end of the day, it's about risk management. So I am seeing that shift from, right, let's just put in a reporting type system to adding the extra value of, right, you know, what are these underlying risks? Let's see it. How can we manage it? And overall, we'll just lower a whole ESG profile, risk profile, let's call it that. Okay, and then some of the other the points I've, I've put down there, uh, you know, create value beyond the reporting, uh, generate, your, generate those re required reports or graphs or whatever you need. If your system is uh, flexible, configurable, it certainly helps. Every company has different requirements. And the whole transparency and accountability comes through when there is a central system. An external auditor, third parties can come in and it makes it a lot easier for them to understand how you're managing your ESG if it is done through a system. Um, it might not always be one system, it could be few, but you know, through some sort of management system. And then a few examples of possible outputs. This is a, 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 a shot of some of the dashboards that uh, we generate. And in this particular example, it's you know showing the degree of, uh, or through the questionnaires, those standards, ESG standards are turned into questions. And then you can gauge through you know, different divisions within your company or different operations globally, you know, how are they um, progressing with that, with answering that questionnaire so that you can get your standard uh, answers or answers to report against a certain standard. So you can then gauge progress on answering those questionnaires. Another example, the scoring, you know, based on an answer set, you can assign a score to it and then see from division to division or operation to operation how the scoring is, um, is comparing and, and then who's doing well, who's not doing well, which, which areas perhaps need attention. So various ways data can be presented to help you understand the situation. So those are just some of the examples, again, that a, a, a management system can help you with. And then on to, to some lessons learned, which is really worth sharing. So one of our first projects was um, actually to an investor, not, not to an operation themselves, but it was to an investor company for one of their uh, funds, which had uh, a dozen or so companies within that fund. And what we realized some of the challenges while we were going through this process is, you know, their reporting requirements and their graphical display of information was quite different to, you know, what, what we thought was a standard. So those changes had to be made. Important to realize to, you know, upfront understand what those outputs need. And you almost want to work back from those outputs. Those uh, within companies, the, the, the users or the, the, those responsible people to gather the data, you know, needed extra training and um, awareness on what it's about and how to gather that data. So it was just quite immature. And then we needed to get those uh, respective people trained up. And then the whole ESG equivalency, which has been touched on in a, on a few talks about, uh, you know, well, there's five or six standards we need to report on. How do we manage equivalency within a system? So that, uh, and then make sure we can solve that problem with basically linking N metric or A indicator to various standards so that you, you literally, you know, answering it once and you can report to a variety of, of standards. So those are some of the challenges we had to overcome. And to look back to some of the points I raised in the beginning, this materiality assessments, it's very important to perform upfront so that you are not only gathering the data to what's material to your company and reporting on it, but also managing those risks. So again, that comes back to sort of lowering your whole ESG risk profile. This collaboration, We've realized more and more that it's very useful to have that ability. And the ESG standard agnostic, what we mean there is, yes, there are management systems that will help you report to a standard, be it a, a GRI or SASB or, or any others. 
However, it does bring in a lot of advantages if it's not specific to a standard that it can sort of, can generate a report or um, an output that can meet a variety of, of standards. So those were some of the learnings that we would take forward and important, I think, for those also listening in, if you in that game to realize, you know, these are some of the issues that's, um, that we've learned that can maybe apply. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. I'll uh, open it up to questions. Fantastic, Robin. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Uh, we have a question coming in, which is the one that is very fundamental, but it's an important one. So what is the purpose of risk management? Well, you know, literally every business needs to manage risk at the end of the day. And, and those risks can be uh, stemming from a variety of, of, of drivers, be it social related, governance related or environmental related. So if you're not going to manage risk, you are opening yourself up to, um, you know, to, to stress situations. So in my view, it, it does come back to just managing that risk to ensure the sustainability of your, your business. So in my view, risk sort of underpins your whole business management. And another question was, how do we make risk management fun and sexy? <laughs> Sorry, say that on again, please. How do we make risk management fun? <laughs> yeah, good question. I, uh, I'm not sure. I, uh, I don't work in the risk area sort of uh, as a focus. Um, how to make it fun? Well, what's good to see is then solving those risks, you know, identifying them solving them and seeing the, the sort of continual improvement uh, it probably can be very satisfying that you can uh, get that under control so to make it fun and sexy i'm <laughs> not too sure but i think there's a great sense of satisfaction if you can get that right and uh, be a huge contributor to the, the success of your business or sustainability of your business if you can get risk management right and look management systems have a place there's other ways to manage risk but uh, um, it's probably a matter of, yeah, get it right and you, you can feel very satisfied. That's a great answer. Um, Robin, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, a round of applause uh, virtually. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. That was a really great presentation. Um, the next speaker needs really no introductions, Sarah. Um, the floor is yours on the topic, integrating ESG into decision-making through enterprise-wide risk management. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much also. And please let me know if I'm sharing the wrong screen, et cetera, because that would be hugely embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. So, um, so yes, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm I'm now taking off one hat, which is the responsible raw materials hat, and putting on another hat that I wear on a regular basis, which is that um, of running a risk management consultancy called Satala. So, um, also asked Robin, really difficult question: How do you make risk management fun? I'm going to stop that particular question at that point in time. Also, so how do you make risk management fun? Well, I'm going to attempt to do that in the next 10 minutes okay so that is my challenge but more importantly how do we make it absolutely vital and useful to incorporating ESG into all of those decisions that we make now the first thing that we need to realize is that risk management looks different depending on who you speak to. So for example, if you go to a health and safety expert, they will generally see risks as being bad, scary stuff or threats that could hurt somebody. Okay, so they will constantly use language like hazards and threats and loss and things like that. So a health and safety expert talks about risk management in their own specific way. But if you then go to an environmental expert who, bearing in mind, may work in the same team as that health and safety expert, they'll talk about risks in a very different way. And a lot of their risks um, get shared with a broader audience through things like an environmental impact assessment. So environmental experts often talk about impacts and aspects and things like that. So that's where the risks lie. And a lot of the discussion within the environmental space is about what could the impact of the mining operation, for example, be on the environment? 
but also remembering that the environment could impact on the mining operation as well. So environmental experts tend to talk about or use risk management in quite a different way to health and safety risk management experts. And then we go into the social space and again, people in the social sphere, and we heard lots of this language yesterday in some of our sessions, they will also be talking about risks, but they'll use this word materiality. OK, and they will do things like materiality assessments, which is just really a risk assessment. But they're looking at, OK, what could all of the mostly external risks to that mining operation look like from a social perspective? And what are all those big material risks that we might be looking at? So social experts use risk management in a different way again. And this gets really confusing because everybody is doing risk management, but they're actually using they're doing different things, but using the same words. Then we go into the world of governance, okay, and your risk management system. So similar to, to what Robin has just outlined with isometrics. And of course, there are, there are hundreds of different risk management systems and approaches out there. Risk management as a tool often slots into the governance component part of ESG. But sometimes as well, within that governance side, we can almost slide and we can say, OK, we're just looking for compliance. We're not necessarily looking for going beyond compliance. And so, again, governance ex experts may look at risk management in a slightly different way as well. And we can begin to build this up. So things like in the finance world. So an accountant, when they talk about material risks, they're talking about something different to the social expert when the social expert is saying materiality okay so this is really confusing we're using the same words to mean different things yet we're all working in the same space and also we're all interconnected so one person's interpretation of risk may be very different to somebody else's interpretation I personally started out life as an exploration geologist and as a geologist um, you are generally very very optimistic you're always really excited about what you might find in the ground so therefore this world of uncertainty poses a massive opportunity to us so we tend to see risk as being positive or being an opportunity rather than just that health and safety mindset which is often risk as just being negative so what do we have here everything is interconnected and it can be interconnected within our organizations and how we view risk and the management of risk but also we need to be including the broader world outside of our organizations as well so outside of that network and exactly as, as Zach was saying earlier on I mean Zach it's almost as if we've worked together in the past isn't it everything is a mesh everything is interconnected and the key thing to remember here is that one person's profile or world or footprint of risks is very specific to their perspective so the social experts world of risks will be different to the ceo's world of risk will be different to say a politician's world of risks and that's why risk management truly is important especially when you begin to integrate things because it's the job of risk management be that a risk manager or the methodology or the tool that you're using to try and pull together this network of perspectives network of potential opportunities and threats and be able to say okay so what what is changing? Because again, as, as Zach was saying, um, shift happens, okay? So change happens the entire time. We need to look at this network. We need to say, okay, what is changing where? If and when those changes happen, will it impact on what I care about? And most importantly, is there anything I can or should be doing about that to try and take control of some of that uncertainty? And that is what we mean by risk management. Risk management is not the really, really boring filling in of an Excel spreadsheet or the really, really boring comparing of potential impact against likelihood on those red, amber, green grids. Those are just minuscule little tools that you can use if you want to in order to help you understand this network and decide where and when you need to take action and then enact that action. So to boil this down, 
risk management is all about knowing what is it that we actually care about from our perspectives and then understanding other people's perspectives and, and what they care about and also understanding okay where's the uncertainty where's all that stuff that we don't really know that we don't understand and it's in that uncertainty space where risk management can make a real difference now just to to take this down to the definition level um what I've just described now is what is encapsulated in a whole myriad of international standards, et cetera, that are out there. So if we think there are lots of standards for ESG and sustainability, there are just as many standards out there for risk management. And don't worry, I am not going to go into this world because that would not be fun or sexy or so. That would be not very exciting. I know there are some people on the call here today who do find this very exciting. But I think the majority would prefer me to move on because actually when it comes to how do you get this to work, it is really, really simple. So risk management can be boiled down to a four step process. OK, so a four step mindset methodology, a four step decision making process. Step number one, let's understand the context in which we're working, how it is changing and what we care about or what we're trying to achieve. Now, when we say objectives, we mean, yes, our targets or our goals, but also the manner in which we want to achieve them. So that includes things like our purpose. So going back to this, the first session we had in the conference, what is our purpose? What are our values? How do we want to achieve all of this? So what are we doing? Where are we going? And what is changing in the world round about us? So that is number one. That also helps us to set at what level in the organization or at what level in society we're trying to understand our risks. Are we talking about the whole of raw materials and responsible sourcing as a whole? Is that the scope of our risk assessment? Or are we just talking about that little exploration camp in northern Quebec? So this picture behind all of this, this is my first ever field season up in northern Quebec. So where the world was really small and we very much lived in our own little bubble where there was there was no TV, there were no cars, there were no buildings, etc. That was our context, opposed to the global context where everything, of course, is very interconnected, etc. So what's our context and what are we trying to do? Secondly, we assess our risks and the assessment of our risks includes three component parts. Number one, acknowledge what your risks are. So identify what those potential opportunities or threats could be round about us. OK, so just acknowledge them. You don't need to say how important they are at this point in time, but just say, OK, there could be something over there. Let's have a little think about that. So that's step number one. Step number two is understanding those risks. And that's where you have that dialogue. You, you discuss with one another, okay, do you think this thing could happen? Do we think there could be another global pandemic or the fact that we've just had one means we're probably safe for another hundred years? Okay, the answer is no, by the way. Um, what is that discussion? Let's understand those risks, which then leads us into step number three, which is saying, well, so what? <laughs> Do we need to do anything about these risks? And actually, can we do something about these risks? Because we live in a world where we are being impacted by a whole load of stuff. And much of that, we can't necessarily do anything directly about it, but we can certainly prepare ourselves for the future. But also we can say, well, you know what? We might not be able to stop the next solar flare coming from the sun. But you know what, we could think about it and say, well, what would we do if that happened? Conversely, can we do something about our emissions pumping up into the atmosphere from, from human beings? Yeah, of course we can do something about it. We can't stop the next volcano erupting, which would also expand a whole load of emissions into the atmosphere, but we can do something about our own human behavior. So what can you control? What can't you control? And that all comes into that so what space. So assessing the risks, acknowledge the risks, understand them, and then say, well, so what? Once you've worked out which of the risks that you want to manage, actually do something about them. And lots of our speakers have been talking about this over the last couple of days. Managing our risks does not mean writing a policy or creating a management standard or doing training. Managing our risks means using all of that and enacting it. So you heard Geraldine earlier on today talking about towards sustainable mining as a standard. And it's a fantastic piece of work that's come from Canada. And the reason why one of the reasons why it's so good is it focuses in on the impact and the action. 
So not let's have a human rights policy and the auditor comes along or the investor comes along and says, yep, yeah, tick, you've got a human rights policy. Instead, we say, what are you actually doing with regards to human rights? And of course, we hope it might be in line with your human rights policy. But the bit that we're looking at here is what are you actually doing? And that is the key behind the management of the risks and this controls space. So a control is something that actively changes the risk. So we're looking for this policy or this procedure doing something. We're not just writing documents for the sake of it. We are enacting change and trying to take control of that uncertainty. So that's the management of our risks bit. And note, if you're not actually managing your risks, i.e. if you haven't got to step number three and all you're doing is step number one and two, you're just writing risk registers, which for some people is delightful. For the majority of people, to be honest, is a bit of a waste of time. OK, so doing all of those risk assessments doesn't mean anything unless you then take it into that management area, which is so crucial. Then we go into our monitoring, our reviewing and reporting. And we've heard this morning a whole wealth of different ways in which we can report on the status of those risks. But also with regards to this, this is about escalation. It's about saying to something, hey, we need to change something here. And that's what we have when it comes through in that monitoring and reviewing. Also, it's about putting in different data sets. So not just the data sets that might be coming from our mine sites, for example. It's about going outside of that and getting independent data sets, such as using satellites to be able to monitor well, what are the emissions that might be coming from a processing plant. So getting that independent data to double check, OK, are we telling the world the right stuff? Or actually, is our sensor that is measuring what kind of emissions are coming out of that processing plant, is it broken? What's going on there? So it's doing all of that double checking that we have. So what this gives us is a nice circular process. And the most important bit of this process is that final arrow, because what that allows us to do is to say, OK, so given the context in which we're trying to operate and the objectives that we're trying to achieve and those potential opportunities and threats, i.e. the risks that we face and our ability to manage them, can we actually achieve those objectives? Okay, can we achieve net zero by 2025 or whatever? Is that even possible? And if the answer is, you know what, given everything that we've got on the table at the moment, the answer is no, we are not going to meet that target. You've got two options. Option number one is to pump more time, money and effort into the management of those risks. OK, and every time you try to manage your risks, it will take take effort. It might be that in terms of human time or it might require money, et cetera, but it will need something to go into that system. If you can't do that because you don't have any resources or you don't want to spend any resources in that area, your only other option is to change your objective. So move those goalposts. As, and as soon as you start using this as your risk management process, it begins to hold everybody to account because it allows people throughout the organization to say, hang on, we've got that target. I know what's going on in my area. There's no way we're going to be able to achieve that unless you give me a massive budget 10 years ago to be able to do it. And so what this allows us to do is not only pull together the insights, the expertise from across a wide variety of different disciplines, this really simple process allows us to translate between social experts, environmental experts, governance experts, because it doesn't matter what kind of language or terms they're using. It's such a simple process. It means it's that translation and that integration tool. So we can compare and contrast financial risks with social risks, which are so, so different from one another. But also it allows us to escalate all of this throughout our organization. So if our CEO is sitting at the top of that triangle, okay, and our front line is down at the bottom of the triangle, it means that somebody in the front line can say, hang on a second, given the context in which I'm working, I can't do what you're asking me to do. And that allows this to escalate up through the organization so that changes in those decisions can be made. So this integrates all of that across the entirety of that ecosystem in which we're working. It's also something that goes massively through time. So the X axis on this diagram is timeline because there are some risks that are short and sharp 
There are other risks that take a very, very long time to build up, especially our environmental risks. And of course, some of our social risks take a while to build up and then they just explode. So you see that conflict happening because you haven't necessarily been managing it or keeping an eye on that context nice and early. So when we're talking about these risks, it's across all of those different time horizons. And for this, there are a multitude of different tools and techniques that we can use and certainly should be using to help pull all of this together. You guys will recognize the little infographic that we've been using for the conference. I could be really, really bullish and say every single one of those is a risk management tool because that's what risk managers do. In fact, every single one of those is a tool to help us manage ESG. And risk management is just another one of those tools that helps us bring together people from across multiple different disciplines and say, OK, we can't all have everything that we want, <laughs> but what is the best decision? What is the best course that we want to navigate going forwards? So in summary, why does risk management help ESG? Well, firstly, we have to use risk management everywhere because it's entrenched in regulation, no matter where you look. They will all say you need to take a risk based approach to this. The key is that nobody actually knows what that means. So therefore, you can interpret it in the way that you like. I'm being fairly flippant with that. <laughs> OK, but use that as an opening. Secondly, risk management allows you to compare and balance different risks against one another. So in this particular situation, what is more important, the health and safety with regards to the people working on the ground or the cultural heritage of that caves that you will blow up if you hit blast on those explosives at this precise moment in time? And many of you know exactly what case study I am referring to with regards to that. So it allows you to compare and contrast and balance those different risks and also translate across those standards. It provides you with an objective method through which different people can have dialogue and can co-create. Okay, so you can say, okay, what are we actually trying to achieve here as a team? I don't necessarily agree with all of you, but yes, I feel listened to. I don't necessarily trust all of you, but if we all come to the party, this is what I can bring and this is the direction which we can go. And finally, risk management, if done correctly, should be a mechanism through which we can hold ourselves to account. So we can say, I said I wanted to do this. Are we actually achieving it? If we're not, OK, what am I missing with regards to all of that? So we can hold ourselves to account. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very, very much and hand back to the lovely author if there are any final questions before we go into our Burst the Bubble panel. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question here in, in the chat. Um, looking at that diagram that you showed us, ethics wasn't mentioned. Um, where would you put that? Um, so I think, I mean, ethics is intrinsic throughout all of this, especially when it comes to that accountability um, proportion. And so I would, I would initially roll ethics into the objectives. So it is the manner in which you wish to achieve your objectives. Um, and one of the ongoing discussions that we typically have in all of this is um, so health and safety. Almost every mining company will say we have a policy of zero harm okay, or zero tolerance. OK, if you truly have zero tolerance for somebody being hurt at work, nobody can come to work. Okay, if you truly, truly mean that. So actually, in reality, you need to work out, OK, well, actually, what do we need to do to keep people as safe as possible? Where does that come in? And so that then gets very much into that ethics and morals type of discussion where we say, what is the reality and what is the manner in which we want to work? Also with that, it allows us to pull together where a company is saying zero harm, but maximum production. They don't necessarily go together unless you've been amazing at designing your mine and your processing plant really early on. So actually, where's the balance? Where's the offset between the two of them? So actually, do you really mean it when you say we're going to stop production if something is unsafe? So you get all of that coming together. And it's the same on the social side, the environmental side, et cetera, because they all overlap. They all interconnect. But so often you need to be able to balance them. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. And a great answer to that. Um, Sarah, I'm going to thank you, but you are going to stay around for, for the coming days, at least. Funny so that. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for this presentation and a round of applause, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Um, the next session, oh, I'm so excited about this. Um, 
we're really moving into to something exciting here. Um, we are going to burst this little mining bubble that we all are in and bring in fresh new perspectives from people outside of the mining industry. So we, we're going to have voices from, from all walks of life and they will give us their views on the mining sector. And I've asked them to be brutally honest. So brace yourselves, everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lensa, Keith, Maria, Hamish, Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will kick off the session with having you introduce yourselves um, and then we will uh, go into some questions that I have for you. Lensa, why don't we start with you? Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you for having me. My name is Lensa Grote. I'm currently a PhD researcher at the University of Leicester. My project focuses mostly around in vitro meats within the nexus of food, water, and energy. But I'm also the co-founder and director of Lenke Space and Water Solutions. We utilize space data to actually help and monitor water quality, but also forecast soil moisture for agricultural purposes. So that's who I am. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. I'm, it's going to be really fun to hear your perspective on the mining sector. Um, Maria, why don't you go next? Thank you. So my name is Maria Arper and I am the founder of a charity called the Centre for Peaceful Solutions, which um, hopefully we do what we say on the tin. And um, I'm particularly interested in dialogue, in the idea that nothing gets done without human relationships. And if we don't pay attention to those relationships, then we're not actually doing anything of any value. We're knocking people out of the way. We're, um, and so the less you pay attention to a relationship at the start of that relationship, the more you will find that you have to sweep up later on. Mm. Or, the, or, the, or the bigger the battle you'll find yourself in later on. So I'm really interested in uh, the power of dialogue. And I came to this because recently I've been in America and I've meet, met some people in Boone County, West Virginia, who are, have been kind of the victims, if you like, of the worst of the mining industry, suffering from the whole mountain top removal. And I intend to work with that community over the summer and beyond in helping them to grieve and heal and rebuild some empowerment. Um, and that's something I'd be interested in talking about as well. Fantastic. Um, that is excellent. Looking forward to this. Hamish, who are you? <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is, is Hamish Hay. Um, it's uh, great to hear from my other panellists as well. It's the first time we've met, I think. Uh, so I'm a water engineer and I've previously worked in the more technical capacity, a little bit uh, similar to what some Lenser was doing in some ways, looking at groundwater resources especially. So there's definitely interaction with mining and materials there. Um, I'm now studying another master's degree in urban ecological planning in Norway, focusing mostly on international development issues. And as part of that, I spent uh, uh, several months in Panaji and Goa, where um, mining is a very, very controversial topic in this, in this corrupt capital, arg arguably, there. So I'm very interested for the discussion. Fantastic. And last but not least, Keith. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join this panel. Um, my background is uh, originated as an electronics engineer. I got involved in risk management over 20 years ago. Perhaps most uh, important from this point of view, I spent three years at Lloyd's uh, looking at emerging risk, and that continues to be my focus. Uh, emerging risk, risk management, and uh, decision making. Thank you very much. Excellent. And you are all joining me in this session because you are not mining specialists. Um, so tell me. What comes to mind when I say mining? And Keith, I'm going to turn to you first. Sorry, who? Uh, yeah, you, Keith. You oh. can start. Um, well, my, my, mine's coloured by being a young lad on holidays in Cornwall, seeing the tin mines down in Cornwall. And, of course, the, the message when you get down there is, is of miners having a hard life difficult conditions and, and sadly quite a shortened life and of course as a, as a young boy that that set an impression on me and of course in the age of 13 here in the UK I don't know if you remember that uh, 
we had a dispute with the coal miners. And so again, that sort of colored my thinking about mining. Later on, when I was at Lloyd's, um, we looked at this more seriously as an uh, opportunity. And uh, Sarah Satalo did a really good report for us on mining. And of course that completely changed my view. Uh, I saw it much more realistically, but uh, yeah, definitely a non-miner. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lensa, what's, what's your idea of mining? Well, I was born and raised in Ethiopia. I'm an Ethiopian. And of course, in Africa, you hear lots of mining, the gold mining, the diamond mining, the kokama, you name it. And most of the resources are from other African regions. And in the process, you see a lot of young people, that, in fact, even women, that end up losing a lot of young people and even the labor cost is also um, rather unmentionable uh, the held accountability and you see the profit going not even to a rich another african but outside of the african country the resources exported elsewhere and so I grew up looking at the children, looking at communities, particularly black communities, taking advantage of not only their physical labor, but their resources, their land. So for me, mining is a rather touching subject, I guess, um, just because I grew up looking at that. Growing up, of course, and being in the science field, you learn a lot what it is and the values it has, but that image never quite lives you. Mm. So the simplest questions are, are often the most powerful. Would you say that mining is good or bad? Are you asking me? I am. Mm. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, mining is good or bad uh, as it is with everything. It depends. That's the best answer to get away. Um, for me, I think we can live without it uh, or to actually live with it, we have to redefine so many aspects of mining, particularly the definition of it itself, the way it's, I mean, what does mining itself mean? It means the extraction of valuable materials for an economical purposes, translation for profit, right? And so for whose profits are you actually doing it? And when you ask those questions, is it good or is it bad? It depends who you're asking mm -hmm. so uh, i don't think it's quite as simple as that but given at the same time the fact that mining for me is the poster child of a capitalist system if, if you uh, when you think of capitalism i think of mining um, and it is true in a sense that capitalism is stands at the back of the exploitation of nature the extraction of minerals from it that is the core of a capitalist system and here you have it, it within the definition of turning minerals and materials into a commodity and that is what it stands for so from a general perspective from just saying yes or no i would say no at a first glance but of course we need to unpack it a bit further perfect hamish i can imagine that you come at it or your experience with the mining sector is a bit more from the engineering mm -hmm. right so what's your view on the mining sector I think of what comes to mind with mining, it's sort of the insert images, I think of a hole or pit or uh, dirt or also gold, you know, valuable things coming out of the ground. I generally think of it on a big scale, um, but the, the impression that comes to mind is generally negative and one where you imagine people covered in dirt, you imagine exploitation, you imagine um, displaced communities, especially, you know, imagine the mines in, uh, in Western Germany or in some of the ones in, in Canada, etc. So that's what immediately comes to mind when I think of mining. So more bad than good. Yeah, and also there is the resource curse, of course, as someone who's interested in international, develop international development. It's, um, uh, there's often a relationship that people see between a high resource, uh, an actual resource rich country and levels of corruption, exploitation and poor public services. Mm. On a personal level, if I think about it, I'm benefiting hugely from mining. I live in Norway now and benefiting from free education and a, a very robust welfare state that's built on the extraction of natural resources. So from a personal level, I'm benefiting, but from a global level, I think about it, negative immediately come to mind. And Maria, what about you? Good or bad? Oh, well, I think that's quite a an arbitrary decision to make but you know I mean I think about 
as a kid, you know, I'm a real urban slum area growing up, you know, so my only real thought towards it as a kid was the minor strikes. So, you know, pain. Um, and then, you know, hearing about, you know, poor, de poor developing countries that seem to have been robbed of their resources, which I think is what Lenza was on about, being made aware of that. And then I think um, in the early 2000s, I had an encounter with a mining company who had um, taken over a mine, a disused mine on the site of a former concentration camp. I did some mediation work around that. Um, and now most recently, um, most recently, this mountaintop removal. So I think it's not good or bad. The word that comes to mind is human pain. Mm -hmm. Pain. And you've touched on so many of the negative environmental, mm. social mm. issues. Yet I remember a bumper sticker in, in the first office I worked in that said, if it's not grown, it's mined. And I had never reflected on this before, um, but it helps maybe showing mining in a different light, particularly mm -hmm. if we consider all the minerals and metals needed to fuel the ongoing energy transition. So do you feel globally that mining could be part of the solution or is it only just a problem? Um, what about you, Lensa? What's your reactions to this? You see, it is very much hard to have these conversations about whether it be responsible mining, which to be quite frank, I don't even know what that means, responsible mining, or you're responsible for, you know, and you are responsible for the economical system, particularly mining. So when you're having these conversations, it is within the context of an already existing paradigm prism of a capitalist system. So when you're even talking about, you're correct, if it is not growing, you're definitely it's mining it. But what are you mining it for? And you're mining it to fuel an existing system, a capitalist system, a profit and accumulation greed system that, that is actually favoring a group of people and actually hurting the others. And so it is very much important to ask this question of if we are talking this whole conversation, we can't go beyond or further um, without actually daring to question and challenge what value means. Unless we create a system, an economical system where value is defined way beyond an exchange value. And it, Excuse me, I'm currently reading Marxist, so my things might be a lot of Marxist because that's the latest book I'm reading. But it, it, this exchange and use value, if we actually start creating an economical system where monetary values are not the only way the human existence is based upon, then you will find out that maybe besides growing, there might be other methods to continue surviving on this planet Earth or actually build a responsible mining with the correct definition of value, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Maria, what are your thoughts on this? A problem or a solution? Is it part of the problem, part of the solution? So I'm sitting kind of where in some of what I heard Lenza say, which is it, you know, it depends at which level you want to you want to address this, because there is a huge philosophical level, a huge level about who are we? Why are we on this planet? What is our role? Um, and interestingly, in contrast to the people I met in Boone County in March, I spent uh, most of March with a Native American tribe learning, you know, sharing and learning. And so, you know, there's a whole other way of being together around we're stewards. There's no such thing as ownership. Things don't belong to us. Um, so, you know, do you want to have the conversation at that level? And then, but if you try to have the conversation at that level, is it going to overwhelm? Because, you know, the fact I can't say good, bad, problem, not I'm sitting here on a bloody computer mm -hmm. and I'm not giving it up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm part of the problem. Every one of us is part of the problem. 
whether we got indoctrinated into it, whether we were just blind and unaware, whether we weren't educated, we're all part of the problem. How do we want to row ourselves out of it? But then I look at, then there's the things like when a company wants to do something in and it's going to affect a community, then how do we have those conversations instead of immediately creating sides? What, are the, what, are the, what is the level of education to, to be able to bring people into a powerful dialogue, to be able to find consent? Or are you coming into that dialogue with a single-minded purpose just to knock some people over? So for me, the measurement, you know, I don't look at things as being right or wrong. There is only one measurement. What is the injury, loss or harm or potential for injury, loss or harm that we will visit on others, on ourselves and on our system by what we are intending to do? And if you can actually have that conversation in any setting, then you begin to be able to figure out ways. And I think what, what touches me as an old fogey that kind of got caught up in this consumerism thing and is having a terrible time with it, is I'm seeing a much younger generation who actually care. Mm. They're actually asking these questions. And so for me, it's like, how do we encourage that? How do we bring that up the ranks? How do we say actually all professional training, if you want to be an engineer or a doctor or, you know, a tree surgeon, it doesn't matter. How do we incorporate into professional training our values around our common humanity? Because mm. if that isn't in there, then you're doing a job at any cost. Mm. So that's, I mean, sorry, I don't know if that was a bit of a rant, but. Perfect. Um, Hamish, you are the younger generation, right? Uh, <laughs> so do you, do, you, do you think that your generation has a different view on mining and, and uh, different expectations perhaps on the mining sector? Um, well, yeah, we, to answer your question quickly, is mining part of the solution? I'd say definitely yes. But I completely reflect what Maria and um, Benko have been saying in that mining is a subset of, you can't talk about mining without talking about politics or values, I think. And um, if one person's value is economic, another person's value is the intrinsic, even spiritual value of nature, then you have a, a problem there that can only be resolved through some form of communication, which maybe Maria would facilitate. Um, but ultimately, the reality in the world is we have... Um, a capitalist system where we have ownership of capital it's being converted to other purposes generally for economic profit for someone and um, in development we like to talk about people's livelihoods or what resources they have available and how can they convert them to useful livelihood outcomes how can they use it to achieve the sort of a meaningful life that they want to achieve and um, whereas mining is kind of looking at a much much bigger scale of kind of on average, smaller numbers of people controlling larger stocks of resources. So if your if your value starts from capitalism, for example, is that no one should own resources, that everyone is custodian of resources, then we've got a big problem with mining because it's all about ownership in general. Mm. Um, therefore, things need to change. If you uh, subscribe to a capitalist system and you think that ownership um, ownership is uh, is the way for the economy to run, the way for the world to run then we have a system where there's a small number of people potentially benefiting from those outcomes. So I think the young generation is uh, perhaps concerned with these more bigger questions of politics and capitalism and how mining fits into them, rather than necessarily than mining as the as a problem. We have a comment here in the chat function saying, no society, capitalist society, socialist, communist, in the past, present, and probably the future has ever functioned without mining. Keith, uh, I'm gonna let, give you a chance to answer, answer the same question is mining part of the problem or the solution thank you I, i'd like to contrast what's been said so far um as a society it's essential you know we can't take clean water to people without iron pipes we wouldn't have health care we wouldn't be having this discussion now on how to improve things so i'd like to focus more on the positive side it's essential and that then reframes the question good or bad into a choice of society 
we can choose to emphasize the good and we can choose to minimize the bad. I think that goes back to what's been said this morning on risk management stages and all the assessments and data collection. That's all about managing the bad, focusing on the good so that we do get it because at the end of the day, it's essential. I agree with the, the, the comment there that you know, the societies, we couldn't function without mining. And it, it's now, this EESG movement is very right in time. We've got to actually now make the good bigger than the bad. Thank you. Um. You may have all heard of something called NIMBY, which is not in my backyard, don't build stuff in my backyard. And the next level that we hear about now is banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. The truth is nobody really likes a hole in the ground and local communities are no exception, but we do still need the minerals and metals as we've heard, and we like them in our phones, in our computers to facilitate things like this how can we improve our relationship with mining? And you have already uh, talked about that a little bit, Maria. Do, would you like to, to expand a little bit more on it? Yeah, I think that improving the relationship is based on, so I'm totally agreeing, we are not going to change the way we live overnight or perhaps even in the next hundred years. So we, we need to say, you know, what is it, what's the raw material we're working with in our humanity? So, so we need to start there. And, um, and for me, it's what is the injury, loss or harm? So, you know, the power of the dialogue and helping people make informed choices and being willing to have certain tolerances for change. Because, you know, what I think about is when I look at that mountaintop removal, the enormous wound in Mother Earth that you can see, they do helicopter rides over it, you know, that enormous wound that so easily could have been tidied up, left in some kind of better ecological state. Um, there could have been so much more that was done after the mining industry left and took everything with them, including jobs, shops, you know, that it's like, well, okay, we are gonna come in and do something and how are we gonna leave you after it's done? And that for me, it's the power of those conversations and listening to the voices. Because one of the things I can tell you out of over 20 years of doing this work is when you get to what I call the real conversation, people will find a way to cooperate and collaborate. Mm. Someone in the chat function here, Norman, he asks, can any of the panelists uh, make reference to where or when they have observed more effective outreach or collaboration efforts by mining companies? Lensa, do you, have you seen anything that has been a positive um, effort or positive collaboration from the mining company side? Right. Um, so I too lived in Norway. And uh, Norway, actually, they're very much strict about uh, which places they're going to mine. And, of course, they're socialist democratic country. And it, just to also reference to the comment that was made earlier, no society has ever existed without the mining. It's not necessarily the mining itself that we have an issue with. It is the context in which it happens. Where does it happen? To which community does it happen? What land is this taking place? And what are the long-term impacts? But more than, more than any of that is the question of what is your relationship with nature as a society? Will mining enhance our relationship with nature or will it compromise it? And Norway, consciously, I think, more so than any other country, has asked that question and are trying very much um, their best, at least policy-wise, in guiding which places to mine, actually allowing the communities to be participating in the decision-making process. You know, it's not an... It is not the, uh, what is it? They're not just going to go to a given community and say, oh, we're going to mine this area for whatever purpose and you have to accept it or whatever. They actually involve the community members of what is going to happen, what are the costs, what is the pros and the cons, and they allow the people to participate in that. But also in the process, because Norway respects nature more so than most communities I have witnessed, it's not only the people that they give regards to itself, it is the nature, the land itself, 
and they actually um I, I forgot the company name but they outsource and they actually mine in some parts of the african countries one in tanzania and another in zimbabwe because land in this particular regions of the african region is where you bury your ancestors you know it is the most sacred thing you can think of so just to go and actually dig it is the most disrespectful thing you can do to the community which is will be a very foreign idea to most westerners you know for them value is embedded within that that any amount of money you give them so when they ask them because they needed that resource when they actually told them okay this is what we're going to do this is what's going to be the outcome of it and what maria just brought in we are going to leave your land in this condition after we actually took out this resources acknowledging what they have done and i was very much impressed by that whole process of it so it is the context i have the issue with it is the process i have a problem with and not necessarily the mining aspect of it itself why are you doing it is it necessary for you to mine all these resources for somebody's greed you know i have yet to meet yes in every society like he pointed out we do mining but i have yet to meet a person that is a socialist mining investor you know you want to meet them like where are they introduce me they exist and so uh, i think it is from that perspective i have seen good things being done uh, from the uh, mining industry as a swede i become very competitive when you say that norway are doing well in this so <laughs> <laughs> I, i think they're doing much better than any other communities have witnessed so far great thank you keith is it more about how it's being done than that is actually being done Do you think that that is the issue that the people have with mining? Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that we're not given appreciation to is the um, long-term investment in mining. It's not something they can set up and collapse over over an, over a year or so. But social attitudes can change. So the, you know, getting back to the core question, what can miners do to actually improve this situation? I think Maria hit it on the head. If they rebalance their accounts to invest more in the recovery of the land afterwards, then they can actually rebuild their uh, position with society uh, and show themselves to be answering this question of ESG. I think um, they can't. You know, these mines established for like 40 years, and they, they've got to get a return back on that. Uh, What actually got us into doing that report with um, Satara in the first place was this concept of stranded assets. The company invests for 40 years, society changes its attitude, and that investment can't be recouped. And I think that's very much a position mining fits, finds itself in. So that it's quick fix is the wrong term, but a quicker fix is for them to shift some of the revenues they're earning in the life of the mine into that area of closing. And I'm minded by that presentation we saw earlier with the graphics um, on the screen showing you know, good recovery and bad recovery. And I think really that's one of the big things society should be expecting in the mining industry to do. Thank you. The mine closure is a theme that keeps coming up. Are you listening, the mining industry? This is what you need to focus on. Um, Hamish, do you agree with, with the example of Norway? Are they doing well in terms of their relationship with the communities? Yeah, I'm sorry. I think Sweden wanted to have a share of the oil wealth in Norway back in the 70s in exchange for Volvo, but it never quite worked out. So um, <laughs> I definitely agree about the sentiment in Norway. And But to address also your question about NIMBYs, I think this really hits the nail on the head because I agree with the, the person asking a question that mining supports society as we know it. But we have kind of global flows of resources, but not global flows of responsibility. And I think actually, uh, this may be jumping the question a bit to some of the further ones, but I think people do care about what they do, what they consume in society, but they do have the information to make good decisions right now. And also who is accountable for ensuring that resources are used responsibly. And I think ultimately that has to come from government. I think the private sector can't fully really provide that. And to provide a practical example of um, land rehabilitation, um, I think a system where, um, where if you require private capital to exploit a resource, there could be a sort of insurance pot that's held aside and like, uh, I guess, curated by government, some kind of government agency to ensure that, that money is used to uh, fully offset any local environmental damage and then restore it and rebuild natural value afterwards, hopefully. And I think if that's going to connect to 
what consumers would expect if people can see this is happening and they can someone can be held accountable for that then uh, then there's a possibility for mining to to ultimately be responsible and contribute to to a better world fantastic and the theme of this conference is responsible raw materials as non-mining specialists um, what would you say responsible raw materials are or maybe let me put it like this what would you choose as the most critical dimension to consider when we think responsible materials i think lenza you kind of touched upon this but but let me start with you right i mean i think that was one of the things that fascinated me with this conference as well is this raw mining or particularly um this responsible raw materials within the context of mining and I asked the question earlier, when you say responsible, who are you responsible for? And the mining industry, first and foremost, as we know it, yes, there are so many policies. Yes, we have lots of conferences. Yes, there are papers. But in reality, what it is mostly responsible for is the economic value it brings. It is that, again, the translation of the profit aspect of it. And while you are actually prioritizing that, to actually, if that is your priority, then the way you go about it will also be different. Let's say if you, if we say the industry is now responsible for nature, the resp the industry is responsible for the communities. The response, you know, you know what I mean. And so now you are asking a much bigger question that mm -hmm. is posing not only <clears throat> the mining industry but also other mm -hmm. sectors as well, which is redefining value right and so this this idea of responsible raw materials in the process of mining i don't quite get it um while we are actually talking about mining having the definition we know it to have changing minerals into a commodity you know if you are changing it into a commodity you're very you're you actually bending down to a capitalist system which it is an immoral system it does not have a particular moral that puts it uh that prioritizes other aspects so i guess i'm a bit confused by the term itself but i'd be very curious to hear what the other panelists will say yeah hamish what what what's what do you think of when you think of responsible raw materials um I guess the yeah, responsibility is diverse. It's responsibility for society, especially the most vulnerable in society. It's responsibility for the natural world and also responsibility for future generations. Mm. The, the, the kind of issue is in our sort of global society is that people don't have a chance to, to kind of express what they need and people have a chance to recognize what other people need in the global society because of imbalances of power and the way people participate in society. So um, I think the crux is people yeah, understanding how can they respond to be responsible for all these elements, particularly the future generations, uh, in, a, in a fair way. And I think in a purely capitalist system, that's not going to happen. So that's where you need to have, ultimately, governance and government to come in. Mm. Keith, what, what would your definition be responsible raw materials? Well, the, the title of this session is Burst in the Bubble. I'd very much like to do that and raise it up and say that this has got to be a partnership between the mining industry, society and governments. Because I would say responsible materials has got to incorporate the whole supply chain and society. So it would be irresponsible to dig gold out of the, out of the earth, to use it in electronics, only for that to end up in landfill. Now, you can't put the landfill on the doorstep of the miners. That's a bigger societal problem. So you've got to look at the whole supply chain. So I would wrap into that, the whole idea of recovering these materials and reusing these materials on the supply chain level and on the social level, really agree with what's being said here now. You know, the whole area around licensing mines and licensing the use of materials for the benefit of society and not the harm of society I think is is a societal and a governmental thing. So I think this is a really big question, responsible mm. for materials. Thank mm. you, Maria. Is it a is it an oxymoron this responsible raw materials? No, I mean look, we're all on the earth. I'm not going to go into some philosophical conversation about why we're here and what's the meaning of life. We are where we are, and for me, the idea of responsibility 
at its minimum, at its absolute minimum, I'm repeating myself again, is a responsibility on all of us to ask what is the actual or potential for injury, loss or harm, and how do I mitigate that? That's a minimum. Then above that, asking what could be the intended or unintended consequences of what I'm about to do and how do I mitigate that? And then when you want to get up a level, the real question, which I know sounds really fluffy, but it's got real content in it, is am I making life more wonderful for myself and others? And for me, it's those three levels and you choose where you want to be on that. And if you fall below it, you're, you're creating injury, loss or harm. Expect people to be annoyed with you. <laughs> Expect people to be angry. And so we're going to go full circle with you. Did anything new come to mind when you heard all these other uh, panellists? Yes, I mean... <clears throat> Rather, my heart, it breaks my heart, I think, that, that, mm. because I, I tend a lot of sustainable things. And what Maria just pointed out is this question are very big questions of what I am doing. Does it bring value to people? You know, am I making a wonderful change? But what a luxury question to ask. What a privileged question to ask. You know, if you actually have to put some food on the table, you will sell your land, you will mine it, you know, your labor will be to very inconsequential to what Apple makes, you know, using all its resources from African regions or other developing regions in Asia, what have you. So the question or my message will be, I dare for the mining sector people to have this conversation, not for the sake of it, but to dare play havoc with the capitalist system. There is really no point in discussing all these things. It, it ends up sounding like Maria just pointed out, just fluffy, because at the end of the day, what we, what we will prioritize as a value will be the monetary value of it. If that is not redefined, really, it's just a meeting we're having right now. And so this is a much bigger question where it poses on every sector, but especially the mining sector. If they dare take that lead, I think we will start creating a much better economic system where asking these wonderful questions will not become just for the privileged and the luxury ones. I mean, time is just flying by. Um, <clears throat> we are getting to the to the end of this panel session, which I've thoroughly enjoyed, um, and I really felt like we did burst the bubble here. Um, to close, if you could pass on one message or request um, to the global mining industry, what would that be? And I'm going to go around uh, to, so that you all can get an opportunity. Um, but Keith, let me start uh, with you. Uh, focus on mine closure and open up dialogue with governments and society about how they can take this further. Maria? Uh, I think for me, it's something about um, that what's at stake are human relationships, whether that's within the workplace, whether that's that miner who has to put food on the table, there are human relationships at stake. And you are never ever going to be able to work with human relationships if you're stuck behind a computer screen, looking at Excel spreadsheets and dehumanizing and doing things and making decisions like the people are over there and you never actually really meet them and talk to them and look them in the eye. Mm. Lensa, what about you? Yes, I think my last message for the mining industry as a whole or the experts would be um, to redefine their relationship with the nature, to make it much more intimate. I think if the industry becomes um, an ally of nature instead of exploiting it, then what we take it, like uh, what Keith mentioned when he says close it, the way I see it is in a way give it back. But it requires that in-depth relationship with your land, with your nature, with your community, with your environment. And so I think to put a heart in the industry, put the, put the heart back into the industry. And that will be my last message. Wonderful. Hamish, last word goes to you. 
my final word would probably be um, to the mining companies would be uh, the global community, especially the young community, cares about value and cares about people's different values. And um, they will be held accountable if they don't hold themselves accountable. So reconsider what you define as value and what other people's values are. Mm, excellent. Um Wonderful, wonderful uh, panel session. And thank you so much here from the chat. I can just reiterate this. Thank you to the panelists for a very open and honest discussion about perceptions of mining. So a wonderful thank you to you, all of you and have a great day. Thank you for your hosting. Sarah, wasn't that amazing? <laughs> that was um, absolutely fantastic. And I have to say that um, all of the different channels have just gone mental um, in terms of the discussion that's being had. So um, I think if everybody can now turn your videos back on again, um, that would be great. Um, and especially Hamish, because Hamish, our grandmother, and I know that she's listening in at the moment, would like us both to do a big wave. So hello, Granny. Um, so full disclosure, Hi, everybody, um, Hamish is my Cousin. We obviously haven't seen one another for quite a long time, but Hamish, thank you so much for taking part um, in that panel just now. And, and um, Lensa, Maria, Keith, absolutely brilliant. And this is exactly what people who work within raw materials, within the mining space every day, we really, really need to be able to listen and absorb and understand all of your perspectives. Because if we just live, live in our own echo chamber or our own bubble, we're going to go and solve problems that don't actually exist. So a massive, massive heartfelt thanks to all of you for that. Um, so ladies and gents, we are we are into the last 25 minutes of um, this morning's session. So this is session number four of the conference of many. Um, before we go into our final wrap up, um, also you, um, you have shown me up totally in terms of how you should uh, compare a session. So thank you so much for just being truly amazing. And um, before we go for some, yep, yeah, so massive round of applause for you. Thank you, Keith, for going there with that. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, also, I'm sure that you've got um, lots of ideas buzzing around in your mind at the moment. Before we go to questions for other members of the full panel, are there any salient points that you think are really sitting in your mind that you'd like to share? No, but it's been a fantastic day. Wow. Um, what amazing presentations and panels. I mean, this has been just amazing. Um, we've, I mean, I've, I've worked with this and these issues around natural resources and development for, for, well, for a longer time, but we've done it with high grade for about five years. And I've talked to so many insightful people and you kind of see over the years, the themes that crop up. Um, and, and really, some a lot of the things that were mentioned today are things that we are also seeing in, in our interviews and in our discussions, um, for example, mind closure. And I, I, I do come back to this because it's something that is being talked a lot about right now. Um, and people are very interested in it. We did an interview a number of years ago with Caroline Digby, professor um, and, and extraordinaire um, about mind closure. And, the reception was sort of lukewarm. I mean, she's fantastic, um, but, but the interest wasn't quite there. But then we have sort of relaunched it and she discussed the Eden project, which I don't know if all of you know about, but it's a project in, in the UK about where they turned a, a mine into this fantastic garden. Um, and from there came a book called 101 Things to Do with a Hole in the Book. And it's sold out. You can't get a hold of it. It's just nowhere to be found. But people have been emailing me, do you know where you can find this? Because we talk about it in the interview. So I really, I, and I was so happy to hear that the, that the non-miners, our fantastic panels also sort of brought that up because that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. How can we, we restore the land that we borrowed for, for, for this and for the human development? So that's really a, um, an interesting theme that is coming up more and more. Also ESG, which we also cover from all aspects. We just had a podcast with um, an institutional investor, a Swedish uh, pension fund and the ethics council there. And from the investor's perspective, how do they look at ESG? And how do they, because they took the approach that they want to engage with the mining companies to make sure that they improve. So, so it's a different approach. And then you, we, our next podcast that we're releasing is, is an also on ESG and responsible mining from, from the RMF, Responsible Mining Foundation. So, I mean, we, we see all these sort of themes coming up. Uh, we really feel that the mining industry 
well, maybe from from external pressure from investors and society, but also that there is this there is this new thinking around their role in society, and maybe COVID helped with that. Kind of opened our hearts a bit, uh, um, I think, and and the relationship with communities changed for a lot of a lot of companies during COVID. So, yeah, those are sort of some of my random thoughts here. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Orsa. And um, if anybody is on the hunt for these podcasts, etc., I'm sure that the link will be put into chat imminently so you can all go in and uh, find them and check them out. And if anybody can track down a copy of one of these books, I'm sure all of us would be very keen to know where you've got it from. Um, now, also, I know that you've got some questions for those of us in the panel. So I'm going to hand back to you for the last uh, remaining section. Um, so thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, so we've been talking about this ESG toolbox, or that's the theme of this conference, and we've heard some fantastic examples and been introduced to some tools this morning. But I want to I want to challenge that a little bit, uh, which is why uh, what we do we play the devil's advocate. Um, in a fantastic interview we, we did with Professor Glyn Cochran, who's a community relations specialist with a long career in the mining sector, he raised a concern about the pro proliferation of toolkits noting the risk of becoming too prescriptive, too focused on box ticking exercises rather than, than the actual work on the ground. Obviously, toolboxes are necessary and helpful, but where do we find the right balance so we don't become too focused on that, but rather on, on what's happening on the ground? Anyone want to jump on that question or should I just attack you? Robin, what do you say? Let's see if, you, if you're still around and want to take yeah. Sure. Um, I, I agree 100%. Um, it has to happen on the ground and it has to get filtered through down from, you know, probably the, the corporate response down to that site, down to that operation and, and infiltrate what's happening on the ground. And that is not commonly happening. So, so that, that point is, is correct. And Uh, yeah, sorry, there was another point I was just thinking I wanted to raise. Um, no, I've lost it. Sorry. I, uh, I'll come back to it if I can. But yes, I mean, it, it, it has to filter down. That's not always happening. But um, yeah, that's sorry, that's come back to me. So, so what we're seeing is that through um, maybe a, you know, a management system or other techniques, that's where the attention has to lie. Being able to transfer corporate messages, statements into actual actions that happen on the ground. And lastly, you know, mining companies, they do do good. And I don't think, yes, and I, and I fully agree that they don't always do good, but those good stories don't always get told. And I think mining companies also have to have a PR exercise or improve that sharing what they do well with the public. Um, but they don't always do that. So uh, I just wanted to add that in as well. Perfect. And Keith has raised his hand, which is a great way of, of, of flagging that you want to answer the question. So please, please go ahead, Keith. Thank you. I would like to say it's a positive thing that these toolkits are emerging and being tested because I, I think it plays into the psychology of individuals and society. These toolkits, these methods are tabled and they make people think. And what comes out of it is what works and what doesn't work. And you think about Sarah's presentation about risk management, which follows on from decades of people coming up with methodologies and little colored diagrams. And then Sarah really pulled it together into what matters and how you really manage risk. And I see these proliferation of tools going the same way. It's a good sign of society trying to understand. And then out of that, we will see improvement. So I see it's positive. Not all these toolkits will survive and we'll see more to come but it's necessary for humans to understand it from a psychological point of view. Thank you. Thank you. We have Grant and Lawrence, and I think, Lawrence, you raised your hand first. So go ahead. Perfect. Yeah, I think the way to look at it is basically from a, a Venn diagram perspective, as in there's definitely areas where the toolkit overlaps the human interaction and the human interaction overlaps with the toolkit, but one should never rule out the other. And there will be moments where uh, the, I mean, we talked about box sticking and in the end, um, partially of the box ticking will make sure that you don't forget about certain things. But by getting back the feedback from the ground, uh, improving your toolkit and making sure that there's a constant dialogue between all the parties, both digital and face-to-face, and -face, 
I think uh, we should think, we think about it more as a areas that supplement each other instead of that replace each other. Great. And um, Grant? Yeah, yeah, just just quickly. Um, I was really fascinated by, by all the presentations and, and they were very granular around specifically looking at what mining operations can do differently with respect to ESG. We actually have a different view because our business doesn't look at the individual businesses and what's going on in the ground. We actually look at it from a broader whole supply chain perspective. So, so what I'm focusing on is it's all very well having 150 mines um, mining a specific commodity that's needed for a specific product. If they're all trading to various ESG standards, sure, those ESG standards can get better and you guys are very good at all that and this discussion helps. What I'm concerned with, what are the 50 mines that we don't even know about that aren't audited that purposely hide who owns them, where they're located, you know, what, what indigenous lands were taken. So, so I think what's going on in the ESG community is really good with the mines that are being assessed to certain standards. I think our focus as a business is how do we create a supply chain so they're not penalised because there's some other mining operation that's feeding product into the supply chain that has no ESG standards because no one knows it exists. Sarah, how do, do we deal with the mines that are flying under the radar? Um, so, I mean, I think, I mean, there's this huge amount of work actually going on with this at the moment. And that's where the the different types of data sets come in. Um, so on Friday morning, we're going to have a very quick interview um, with Gareth Morgan, the CEO of Terabotics. And they um, use satellite images along with different types of remote sensing techniques to say, OK, um, where is their mining activity? What's changing? Um, and then overlaying all kinds of different data sets to say, OK, what does this actually mean? Now, people have used used these sort of data sets for many, many years to try and understand that broader change of land. And so going back to the fact that what we're talking about here is the use of land, the stewardship of that land. We're talking about that full value chain and making use of those raw materials and having respect for them. I think this is a case here where mining, and exactly as many of the speakers this morning have been saying, mining is only one component part. And this picture is much broader I loved what Lenza said about it's not the mining that people have a problem with, it's the context. And that I think is one of the really juicy nuggets um, that we've got coming through from this. So when you look at it from the context perspective, suddenly that ability to verify, understand and hold different bits of that value chain to account becomes much more interesting and perhaps much more valuable. Um, so um, yeah, lots more comments that I could add, but I will stop there because I know that uh, Master Zach Wood had his hand up. <laughs> yes, please go ahead, Zach. Did you change your mind? I, no, I mean, you just, you said it and you said it much more eruditely than I could. We, if, if, uh, we're right to look at mining and to look at them critically, but if we only focus on mining, then we're only doing half a job. There's a whole value chain here that we have to be considering. And that's why I think Grant's uh, sourcing uh, approach is very powerful. I, I think if we're not looking at that full context and drawing it all together and taking a solid look at it, uh, you know, we're really just speaking into the air otherwise you know we we can keep and i will point out sorry i will point out that uh, it's a weird thing because when you hear something like the uh, the bubble breakers so powerful so great but as somebody who's been in mining a long time it's so difficult not to get defensive and to go <laughs> oh you guys don't know all the good stuff that they do um but i will point out you know during during this uh, this COVID crisis in particular and I'm speaking in particular about South Africa now. But the mining industry did unbelievable work, uh, in many cases, covering for a lot of the deficiencies in government. You know, yeah. and, uh, and that's not to have a go at our government in particular. I mean, most people on this call are subject to rubbish governments at the moment. You know, so, so I, I mean, I... There's, there's absolutely, there's tons and tons of work to be doing well, but it's all part of a context. It's all part of a big network and we need to be looking at that whole picture as well. Anyway, but sorry, Sarah, as I said, you said it better than I did. I don't know why I have to repeat it. But why are these good initiatives not well known? What is it that the mining industry is not doing to communicate those good stories? Is it PR, a PR issue? Well, I, 
uh, sorry, I, uh, I don't think PR is trusted. I, I mm. think uh, one of the reasons that it's not well communicated is because everybody's a little bit aware that, uh, and this is not mining, this is business in general, has a long history of just putting out rubbish. And that's where I think that all of these toolkits become so powerful because it's, it's about saying, how do we create a, uh, an integrated and defensible narrative, a narrative that is data-backed and that we can present and we can show and we can say, look, this is exactly what we've done. Um, and so there is that data. It was those, those, that Venn diagram I showed earlier. There is the data, but it's, it's the narrative that comes off that data that's so important. Uh, and that's not a PR function. That's a case of transparency and sharing and being more um, integrated as our kind of in our broader ecosystem. We are we're getting really, really, really to the to the end of this. Um, but I want to run a quick poll. <laughs> we'll see how many of you uh, will have time to answer this. But we we run polls regularly on. Uh, on our social media, and it's very interesting to hear the polls. So, I'm going to try a quick one with you. If you had to pick one priority in the responsible raw materials universe for the for the industry, which one would it be? Any takers? Lawrence, let's start with you. Um, I would say transparency because at the moment we've been speaking about managing risks, understanding them, et cetera. But as long as we don't know who's doing bad, who's doing good and how are they managing it, I think in the end, transparency and understanding what are the impacts in terms of all the ESG metrics that exist and along the full supply chain and actually being honest and open about that, that's the only way of gaining these insights. Okay, transparency is one. Keith, what would you say? Uh, similar. It's a word that's challenged me for a long time, and that's authenticity. You can go into these things, you can get it wrong, but people are very perceptive as to whether people are being authentic or false. And so very similar to what's just been shared. Sarah? Oh, I'm dithering between accountability, so actually saying, yeah, this is what I can do, but then more than that, action. So get on and do it. So stop talking about things and actually get on and take action and make that difference and accept that actually some of those actions may be wrong, but keep a close eye on them and then be able to reverse out of it if you realize it's going in the wrong direction. But we've got an awful lot of talk. Let's now see the action. Hey, I'm, I'm sh shamelessly turning to you <laughs> without raising your hand. Do you want to add something, Grant? Oh, yeah, yeah just quickly. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, transparency, uh, just to, just to um, um, amplify um, what Lauren and, and, and Zach said. And the reason why transparency is so important, because it actually ties to the notions that humans, when faced with, um, with truth, make decisions that allow um, a more fair and equitable world. So, you know, that's why transparency solves issues, because when humans are aware that things are unfair, and the resources that we use aren't necessarily benefiting the entire value chain, that we do make a difference. So if we get transparency, we know things aren't perfect. Um, we can shine the light in areas that um, can help them be fixed. So I think it really ties on the human nature. It's actually a lot better than what we're talking about. Perfect. Robin? I agree with, agree with all of that. Um, maybe the other thing I'd add is just governance. You know, we talked about, you know, perhaps mining operations under the radar, you know, then you can put corruption and illegal activities. But if the right governance is in place, that should prevent a lot of a, a lot of the harm companies do to the mining industry. So agree with all of it, maybe just throw in the whole governance aspect. Perfect. The final word goes to you, Zach. Oh, I could add much, although I noticed uh, behind Grant, a little poster there that says be brave and I guess that that's another good one just for us all to keep in mind. And Lensa, um, you on the word here. Uh, yeah, um, I think empowering communities has to be the biggest responsibility of the mining industry. You can be as transparent as you want but a community 
might have the knowledge, but if they don't have the tools to take actions or to stand up against whomever that industry or that investor, whomever it be, then what's the point of them having that knowledge? A lot of us know what's going on. We just are not empowered enough to stand up against them. So empower the community and the land you inhabit. I think that's the biggest responsibility. Perfect. I think that is it. That was a fantastic poll. And my job here is done. Sarah. <laughs> Over awesome. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please put your hands together, not only for the fantastic panel, but a massive, massive thank you to Orsa, because that was truly brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Um, and um, thank you for steering us through um, what's been a really, really great session this morning. And wow, are there so many sound bites? Put the heart back into mining. Thank you, Lensa. Um, I've got a computer and I'm not, insert various words, giving it back. Um, things like that. So some, some of those comments that came through, um, truly great. And as, as Zach said, it is really hard to hear some of this this feedback um, as people who work within mining, but boy, have we got to hear it um, because otherwise we'll just be going in the, in the wrong direction. So a massive thank you to all of you. Um, just to remind all of our wonderful attendees and everybody who is watching potentially on repeat out there in YouTube, because of course, after a year of lockdown, Netflix and all of those other channels have run out of content. So that's one of the reasons why we're here. We are generating more content for you guys to watch. Um, everything is being recorded. Um, we are on top, I think, of the editing. So you'll see that most of the sessions from yesterday already have their videos inserted into those abstracts. We are attempting to collate together all of these different tools and techniques, etc., that we are hearing. Um, we've yet to work out how to actually then share that directory of tools, um, because these should be things that can be used rather than just a tick box or something like that. There's nothing worse than a box just to be ticked. Um, so all of that will be coming. And a massive thank you to everybody who's been getting in touch with us offline and sharing their ideas and their tools so that we can collate all of this together. So this was session four this afternoon, because I think most of us here are somewhere along the lines of, of GMT type direction in terms of time zone. So for most of us this afternoon, we then go into session five, which for all of the Americans, yes, this will be your morning session when we go into that. OK, so this afternoon session is going to kick off with um, Andrew Buchanan from the Miner Minerals Processing Institute. And we then get off into Monica Ospina, who's one of the most entertaining speakers I think many of us have heard last year she talked to us about broccoli if you want to find out about why go and check out her video on the website yeah why was she talking about broccoli I can't quite remember at the moment but it was fantastic okay so we're going to hear from Monica Espina um, we've got a whole variety of other talkers um, including Maria Arper who you heard earlier on today who had fantastic insights from her bursting the bubble perspective she's going to talk to us about working with different communities and, and more than that sort of um how to have those discussions across different parties um we have got um members from sustainalytics so we're looking we're, we're welcoming people who spend their lives creating those sustainability indices um now there are positives there are negatives etc that come in hand with regards to a lot of those so we're going to be hearing a lot of the ins and outs of that from uh, dana this afternoon and then we have amy bullinger from the initiative for responsible mining assurance so one of those those really very detailed and fantastic um, modes of assurance that can be used by mining companies, by investors, by customers to ascertain what is going on on the ground within those mining operations. Um, and then finally, we finish off with Mark Borbus, um, who comes from, again, that world of communication and training, who's going to help us with that final panel session. So a really exciting session coming up later on today. Um, you've now got a really beautifully long lunch break to check those emails, maybe go for a walk. It is pouring with rain here in the northeast of Scotland. So I'm going to go and find a different source of power to get me through the afternoon because that's what happens when you're off grid. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, a massive, massive thank you um, from all of us. And we will see you all in a few hours. Thank you very much.